Well, hello everyone, and welcome to episode ten of Switcher Player. We've hit a milestone, Mickey. Yeah, um, we didn't know when we started off whether we'd get past episode one. To be honest, the trial run. But <laughs> um, yeah, really, really um, happy that we've got to ten, and it's uh, hopefully going to be a, a fantastic guest tonight. Absolutely, Richie Humphreys, a, a, a guy we both know well. Obviously, you were in a dressing room with them for so long. What was he like as a teammate? Um, he was annoying at times because of how professionally he wanted to be. Um, football wise, it's fantastic. His ability, his vision, his technique was brilliant. But as a teammate, absolutely top notch because he, whatever he did, was for the good of the team. He was very, very well, not very often at all did he put himself first. And um, but the one thing, if you speak to any of the lads, was how professional he was. And sometimes that probably showed us up a little bit. But, um, yeah, another person that if, when the chips are down, you'd want them on your side. And that ability you talked about, you know, and he's putting them, you know, the same first, was short in how many different positions he played. I mean, he signed as a striker, but he played all over the place, didn't he? Yeah, and, and probably the positions he didn't play, he could have played. He could have <laughs> played centre-half, he could have played sweeper or any, because he's that good a footballer. And I think the one thing with Richie is, is, is his vision and his sort of, just his pitch know-how, he knows where the ball's going to be. And, and he, he just, again, as a young player, he was a really real talent in the English game, really. So, uh, yeah, but Mr. Reliable could play anywhere. And as I say, would play anywhere just for the, to, to try and help the team. Now, Richie got his testimonial a few years after yours. But yours was actually, well, tomorrow. We're recording on Tuesday night. But tomorrow... 14 years to the day since your testimonial against Leeds, Mickey. What are your memories of it? Yeah, it was a strange day, to be honest, because it's, it's sort of, you, you want it to go that well for everyone else, really, the people who have planned it and prepared it. And um, it went over it so fast. I remember getting there and, and obviously Nick and the kids were at the ground at the time and, and you just it's sort of blinking. And I remember coming off and, and obviously getting a round of applause when I come off and, and Danny saying, oh, well played and this, that and the other. But it was just such a nice feeling, you know, that people have turned up for you and, and to, sh to, to basically thank you for what you've done for the club. And I think any footballer that can, can have that is, um, is very lucky. Yeah, I, didn't think, I don't think Leeds would have thought it was going to be so long until I got back to the Premier League like after that. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I think, um, I think it was probably a couple of years I thought it would get back in. But they're back there now anyway, aren't they? And I think they'll do all right. Absolutely, yeah. Just before we move on, I just want to say a uh, good luck to Pete Stevenson, a uh, Hartlepool fan who um, he works for Northampton Town Football Club actually, and he, he's doing a charity bike ride with his mate this week. There is, yeah, I saw that. A few different causes, and he was very, very um, helpful with me last year when we were organising to train at Northampton's training ground on the way down to a getaway games. You know how um, how helpful that is, Mickey, when you're travelling long distances like yeah. Hartlepool do. So good luck to Pete and Adam. Um, can, I, can I just tell you a quick story about, I, yeah. I don't know whether you were there, when Newley was there, when um, we trained at Northampton. And uh -huh. uh, he said to the bus driver, Mark, uh -huh. that he would run a, a full lap of the pitch and Mark uh -huh. had to run half a lap of the pitch and he would beat him. Right. So Mark, I mean, Mark wasn't the fittest guy in the world, but he thought over half a lap. He said, the only condition is I'm going to give you a little cup of water. You have to drink the water to give me a head start. So we were like, all the lads were watching. And obviously, we didn't know what was going to happen. Newley was pretty, pretty fit as well. So about to set off, one, two, three, go. And he gives uh, Mark this cup of water. But what we didn't know was boiling hot water. So Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark couldn't drink it because it was that hot. So Newley just jogged around the full length of the pitch. That's brilliant. I know, it was it's class. Going to up, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Was, obviously, he knew what was going to happen, but no one else had seen him before, so that was great. <laughs> right, well, welcome to Switcher Player, Richie Humphreys. Uh, good evening, Richie. How are you? Good evening, fellas. What a pleasure to be on this. Uh, <laughs> been, uh, keeping up to speed with all the... I'm a bit nervous, to be honest, because the others have been so good, so interesting, insightful. Um, I hope that we can go through through my time at Pools and, and share a bit of... Uh, the, the good times as well as the difficult stuff as well. To be honest, Holmes, we wanted someone that had bigger guns than Fletch after last week, so we <laughs> thought of you straight away. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> Not in the football league, is there? <laughs> Honestly, I, 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 we were a bit worried about Fletch because we don't know him that well, but he, he could talk Fletch like he was class. 
you know, are very good. So yeah. they've all been very, very good. Um, and like, obviously, there's been players from from my, from our teams, um, players from before. Obviously, the owner, manager, ex players. So it's just been, I think, particularly in this time where we might well might have been, you know, searching for something that's that's close to us and, and close to, you know, evoking memories. We're kind of nostalgic, aren't we? A lot of us um, yeah. about you, you wrote, particularly us at our time, our club in, in football. But I think any football fan. Um, is it so? It could be any any football club. I did a Sheffield Wednesday one, um, like a couple of years, maybe a year ago, um, and like just loads of fans absolutely loved that little bit of nostalgia. Um, it's like when you put an old record on of your old favourite band who aren't around anymore, still think they're the best, and you know what I mean. Um, so let's let's get a little bit of flavour of how the uh, the whole coronavirus things affected you and your role because you're you're working now still for the PFA. So how has what you've been doing been impacted by the COVID outbreak? Um, well, of course, when, when, the, when the game shut down, um, there was a lot of questions that were being posed that we all wanted the answers to, um, whether you were a player, a, a coach, um, a chief exec, a supporter. Um, when is it going to resume? You know, is it going to be finished? Are we going to play the games? Will fans be back? When's the transfer window open? When does next season start? You know, um, all those sort of questions which nobody had an answer to because of the impact of the, of the virus. And that's that's a snapshot of our industry. I mean, the whole world was like it, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and so so for us, eventually, um, you know, we, we got to speak, you know, we have my job is is to work with the uh, with the players at the club. So I'm a delegate liaison executive. And um, so I have 18 clubs to look after. So I have um, like when I was our PFA rep at Hartlepool, I've got a PFA rep at, at every club. And so liaising with them, um, eventually, you know, some clubs were on furlough, um, some clubs did uh, pay deferrals. So there was a lot of, because uh, it's a change to the player's contract. So it's something that obviously ought to get looked over legally yeah. and make sure the players were comfortable with it. And to be honest, the, the, the players, you know, the players and the clubs I've dealt with have been, have been great. Um, it's a difficult situation for everybody, um, you know, and I suppose the, the deferrals, you know, they will get paid eventually, you know. So um, the difficulty now we've got, obviously, is as we've, as we've run out and obviously Championship and Premier League have, have managed to get the games in as our playoff games. Um, but is those, like, we've had, Mick, you know, throughout the years, hundreds out of work during the summer yeah. on a normal season. Uh, and, of course, this will have impacted more because clubs don't know um, the start of next season yet, maybe don't know the budget, don't know when crowds can return, which will affect the budget. Um, so maybe not recruiting as quickly as normal. So we'll have more players out of work. And so obviously our uh, we have what's called a benevolent uh, fund, uh, which can help players out who are falling on hard times. And of course, at this at this stage, we've got lots of that. So Richie, is, without naming any clubs that you work with, have some clubs been better than others dealing with players and, and sort of how they've handled the players and or, or have all been very similar? I think it's um, every club has different circumstances, don't they, mate? You know, yeah. so, you know, if I'm dealing with, uh, it doesn't matter, I suppose, if you're dealing with a Premier League club or a League Two club, each club has different circumstances and each club have, have dealt with it, I suppose, <sighs> slightly differently. But but what we tried to do was, was to maintain it as, as, as much as a, a collective as possible. Um, and so, you know, whilst some clubs haven't done anything, other clubs have. So it's been... It's been working with with the delegates or with the club captain, um, with the club secretaries and the CEOs, um, and and trying to make sure that we've got clubs, you know, that, that survive th throughout this. Um, yeah. You know, particularly obviously for in the in the professional game, um, but of course, you know, beyond that, it's going to affect uh, the whole of the football industry. So, with with the players, sort of maybe starting later, Richie, will will they have to change? The contracts and when contracts start and finish for next season, or will there be a similar? Or there's hoping to finish the season at the same time, even the start a little bit later. How does that work with the players' well, contract? Well, obviously, as you know, Mick, players' contract would start normally, and it, you know, it could be depends when you sign. You know, I suppose, uh, but they always finish 30th of June if yeah. you're on a one-year contract, let's say. Um, and so. If we got if we're getting a, a normal season, whenever we do start this season, the contracts will run to 30th of June. Now, what we right. had to do at the at the end of this year um, was some players could sign an extension, 
obviously because the season's gone through June and into July. Um, so some clubs have, have uh, maintained, retained some players on those contracts, on those short-term contracts, but not everyone. So again, depending on clubs and circumstance. Yeah. I mean, when we spoke to Daryl about this, and it was a while back. There we go. You're back uh, on. <laughs> um, two seconds. He was saying that now he thinks it's gone back into the, the club's favour about contracts and that they'll have more options with the players on sort of offering them less money, if you like, because there'll be so many players out of contracts. Is that something that players are going to have to deal with for a couple of years, or maybe even longer than that? Do you think? I don't. Know. I think. I think it's been um, depending on which club it is and what what value of a player you are. I suppose. Um, you know, if you scored thirty goals last season and you're a free agent, people are going to want you, aren't they? Um, yeah. So it, it, again, it's possibly so that if, if clubs that's all they can afford, um, some clubs are already in that position before this year. Um, so players will offer contracts to uh, clubs. Sorry, will offer play, contracts to players um, on what they see fit and value. You know, you've done your own contract negotiations, Mick. So have I. Um, you try and get the best deal for yourself and your family, uh, and that will maintain. So, and obviously, the players can come to us for advice. Um, you know, they know that oh, lots of players have agents and advisors, um, but we're always here to give our advice on that. In terms of that, what you mentioned earlier about, you know, the chances are that the volume of players who may be out of work for longer, you know, and may not get a contract back in football, what kind of support is there for them? Because it's something we've talked about a couple of times on this podcast and I know Mickey's been very open and honest about how how low he was when he, you know, was, was outside of the football bubble, if you like. So in terms of the impact it has on, on players and former players, what, what support is there out there that, that you know of? Well, from the PFA point of view, um, and this can be whether you're in contract, out of contract, current player, former player, um, we've got a 24-7 uh, helpline right. um, from our wellbeing department. And, you know, you'll always get in touch with somebody at the end of the phone. Um, they may look, uh, link you to a local counsellor, um, whether it's Michael Bennett, our head of wellbeing, or Jeff Whitley, um, who also worked in our wellbeing department, both trained counsellors. Um, we'll, we'll be in contact. Maybe somebody I've spoken to in a club um, or they've come to me. Not always. Obviously, that's why you have the confidential helpline, um, which is there. Now, there can be lots of different um, times in your career, whether you, you, know, you might be going through an injury, a long-term injury. Um, you may have that panic about your performance. And then I think, I, I know certainly um, for myself and, and players, for the majority of the time I was at Hartlepool, we were only ever on one, two-year contracts, possibly three sometimes. Maybe that came with an option. Now, um, there's always that worry around March time. I always found that, that, um, you know, you, you don't want to panic, but you've got children, you've got mortgage. Well, if I get, stop getting paid in June, well, you know, July, what happens then? Where, where, you know, what happens? In, and that's where you try and, you'd like to get that contract sorted if you're going to get a new one or be told at least early on, but it doesn't always work like that. And that's the difficulty that players have to face up to. Um, contracts and, and stress about, are you going to get a new contract? Um, there can be even the stress of if you're doing amazingly well and you look like somebody might come and get you on a, on a, a bigger improved contract elsewhere, but the club want to keep you and then they might be arguing over a fee. Yeah. So there's lots of difficulties that, that, that that's current players, that, that current players face. Um, and of course, when, when we move on and we transist out of, of football into our second careers, I think the, the work we do um, for current players and for ex-players, depending on when they come out, is, is trying to re-educate and trying to educate yourself so that, that second career starts as soon as possible and that transition is as soon, smooth as possible. So we, we have their education department, which you get funding for to get on courses and um, get grants for. We have a transitional weekend or a transitional day. Um, where you can attend and, and speak to people from different sectors, uh, different industries. And you might, if you, if you go on that I feel as a current player, you might have an insight. You might be 25, but you might have an insight that when you get to 29, 30, um, you might have an insight about what you might want to do. It's not always, not always that clear cut. I mean, for, me, for myself and Mickey, when we were doing our, you know, you know we, I wanted to coach and I wanted to manage. 
and that was the route I wanted to go down. It's obviously very popular, as are other jobs in football, physiotherapy, sports science. Um, and as, as you get a little bit older and, and you, you learn other things and you, you take on board, um, I suppose, your own, your own life, your own family life. And then, um, you know, I've transitioned into something where I'm still helping players. I'm not coaching them, but I'm still helping players. I'm still involved in professional football in, in that way. Yeah, I think, I mean, speaking from my own point of view, Mark, and, and I know Richie knows this, I, I went through a period where I just felt, and mine wasn't straight away after football, mine was, what, nearly seven, eight years after leaving football, where I just felt lost. I felt I didn't really have a sort of <clears throat> plan of what I was going to do next. And, and that leads to worrying about your family, finances, and and it was my wife, I came in one day and she said, look, you need to talk to someone. And it was, it was my idea of absolute hell going to see. But she rang the PFA hotline for me and within probably less than a week, I was speaking to a counsellor through the PFA. And as, as I said, it was, it was the worst sort of 24 hours late number than I've ever had because I was so worried that I was going to be judged about but I didn't really know what I wanted to see. That was the that was the hardest thing for me. I knew I needed to talk to someone, but I didn't really know what it, what it was about. So when you actually go in, and and I mean the, the woman that the the, the counsellor herself was was brilliant. She knew nothing about football, which for me helped me. And um, I spent an hour just offloading, and she didn't really speak. She just listened, and I was emotional. I was upset, and but things were coming from left, right and centre that I didn't even know I was so anxious or worried about. Things that come from childhood memories, this, that and the other. And for that hour, I came out of it and I was so emotionally drained from it. But afterwards, it was like such a relief. And it was, I think it probably something that I needed to do two or three years before, if I'm being honest. But I didn't have the courage to go and to reach out and get, it was only when Nick saw within us that she was like, you need to do that now. And, it, and for anyone that's in that situation, whether you're a footballer or not, just talk to someone that doesn't know you and can't judge you. And the one thing she said to me was, what you tell me doesn't affect me. Whereas if you talk to your wife, that affects your wife and maybe how she thinks about you as well. And I think that was such a big thing for me that what I was telling her wasn't going to affect the next day in our lives or, or the next month or year or whatever. And she could just listen and advise from her from a point of view where she didn't know me, she didn't know my friends or my family, and it, and it was such a big help to me. But me, uh, for me, like, listen, you, you, you could you know, pick up the phone to me, Tinks, whoever it might be, but it's not, it's not the same. You're offloading to somebody um, that, that's professional. That's, um, and what I feel is it's so important and how that, that you're speaking, you're letting, you're letting former players know that, um, that this topic of conversation is okay. Because perhaps when we were in our early 20s, there probably wasn't an outlet to go to. Yeah. There wasn't somebody you could speak to. And I think it's really, really brave for it, for, for players to, not just players, I think maybe um, just it's become a more acceptable in society for us to talk about well-being and mental health. Um, it's not something that we would have spoke about in our changing room. No, no way in, in my early time, maybe a bit towards the end because you get a bit more experience, but, um, you know, higher profile players have, have spoke out about it, um, ex-players, current players, um, and, you know, the fact that we have our own um, designated uh, department shows that we're trying to help, you know, uh, current and former members because, you know, sometimes it can lead to, to, to further anxieties that may be addictive issues. Um, so where we have sporting chance, where people go to residential, um, and that's from all sports, um, but it, it, we've got a partnership with those. So it can lead to, to, to other things, but I think for someone like yourself, I don't remember how many games you've played, four, five, and 600 games, being able to speak out openly um, about such an important topic um, that we all probably are continually edu educating ourselves about. Um, I, I, I think the one thing I remember saying to the council, I said, I wish I was coming to you with an addiction, with something where I could say, this is the problem I've got. 
how do I fix it? So if I was if I was an alcoholic or if I was gambling too much, there's a there's a clear sort of pathway of how to make yourself better. But when it's sort of your your thoughts and your anxieties, it's hard to like I, at the end of it, I said to her, so what do I do now? And I was expecting her to give me like a checklist or some points on what to do next. She said, I don't do that. I just like advise as we go. You're not going to get something from me where this is going to say how you're going to get better or how to improve your lifestyle. And then I said, I'm here to listen. And she says, I'll keep some notes, but they'll only be for my own privacy. Um, but in a way for me, like I said, it would have been better if it was just, right, I'm an alcoholic, I need to stop drinking. But when it's a mental issue, when it's your sort of own thoughts and and things that you don't really want to talk about, I think sometimes that's harder than going there with that one problem or two problems, like, like what you're talking about, Richie. Yeah, I, I, I think that even with my own, um, like, non-football, my school friends, you know, it's a WhatsApp, our WhatsApp group is kind of lads are, uh, are just checking in. You know, if anybody, you know, anyone needs a chat, give a shout, go for a walk in yeah. the park, have a coffee, whatever it is, doesn't have to necessarily see a pint down the pub. Um, and I think that's where we've shifted a little bit for our generation um, that, you know, talking about it, sharing it, it, it definitely helps. Um, I mean, and I, a, during the time when I left Hartlepool and I didn't know whether I was going to be a footballer anymore, and it was only a short space of time, maybe a month or six weeks, um, it was a difficult time about because yes, you know, we both qualified as A license coaches. Um, there would be opportunities, but I still wanted to play football, and I wanted I wanted somebody else to give me a, a, a go at, at, at carrying on of a profession that I absolutely adored, and I thought I'd got something left. Um, but that that time of of not having going to training, um, of, of doing it for, for however long it was then, I don't know, seventeen, eighteen years. Um, I probably scared us a little bit because I was having to go out just down the park, do a run, maybe go to the gym. Um, and, you know, fortunately, very, very lucky, you know, I managed to go out on trial at Chesterfield and, and secure myself a year's contract. And that led, to, you know, to, to me playing for another three or four years. But and I think during that time, then by the end, I was I think I was ready. You know, I was 39. To like, <laughs> I couldn't run about much like, but I think I was ready to to move away from going into a dressing room every day. Um, and I suppose you, you are not of the generation of 18, 19 year olds anymore. Um, and so that, that, that small period of time I had where I was extremely worried, um, I think towards the end, I was probably more, more confident that I could move into another, another industry and another job and another second career. I remember Richie, when you were, coming to the end of your Hartlepool contract. And you talked about it quite a lot about playing on. And you, I, I remember you seeking lots of people's advice. And the one thing I remember you saying time and time again was that, I don't know who it was who'd given you the advice, but someone had said, play for as long as you can because you're a long time retired. And you kept on, that was the thing. And I always knew, even though we were discussing it and thinking, do I retire, do I not? Listening to your talk, I always knew you were going to play and play and play until you, till you, you no longer could. Well, we are, aren't we? We are retired a long time. Um, and, you know, listen, even if I'd have retired at 30, I would have had a good career as a professional footballer. That's, you know, it's above the norm. Um, you know, particularly doing what I do now, speaking to, you know, scholars who have recently been released or young pros have recently been released, and they're going to have to try and get fixed up somewhere, whether it's in the league, whether it's dropping into non-league and, and trying to bounce back again. Um, so, you, you're right, I did used to say it a lot, and I wanted to play, and you've obviously got a lot more experience after you've played 500 games, 600 games. Somebody may think, well, yeah, he's 36, but he could play in a few positions and he'd be good in the changing room. Um, he's got to 36, so he must be a decent pro, that kind of thing. So I was really fortunate, and it wasn't far from home. We just had another baby, um, and it, it kind of worked out you know, perfectly, really. Do you see yourself going back towards the coaching and management side, or is this you now? I don't see it, to be honest. No, I was contemplating. I know that um, during my time at Chesterfield, uh, my A licence, you have to do, keep up some CPD every three years. Um, and so I did do that at that point. Um, and I did get into coaching um, at Chesterfield. Um, and I was thinking it might be coming up now for more CPD to keep my A licence up to date. And would I 
would it continue to do that? Um, I think as an educational tool, it's really, really good because you're, you're speaking to people within football. Would I go back into coaching or will I? Um, I mean, you do never say never, but I, I, I can't see it now. Um, I just, you know, I suppose you don't know what life throws at you, I suppose. It's interesting. Interesting. Um, so let's let's go back to the very start then, Richie. Let's go back right to the very start of your football career and your journey because uh, obviously you exploded onto the scene at Sheffield Wednesday. How did hold you... On, hold on, Mark. Can we go right back? Because there's yeah. a rumour that Holmes used to be a goalkeeper. Is that true or not? No, Holmes never used to be a goalkeeper. However, I was... I got released from... Well, if we go way back, <laughs> if you want like the sob story and all that, I got released yeah, go from Sheffield United. So my, my club, Sheffield United, uh, was at the Centre of Excellence, 10s, 11s, 12s, and got released. Um, well, what it is, not good enough. Da, da, da. So myself and uh, Kevin Davis, ex Bolton and Southampton striker, both got released at the same time. Kev went to Chesterfield and I w didn't have a club. And so I think I went on trial at Rotherham, nothing. Uh, it was a school holidays. You know, I used to go on trials and that mixed school holidays. Yeah. So I went over to Barnsley. Um, from just playing with Sunderland, went to Barnsley on trial. I was having a stinker, to be honest. <laughs> a couple of, it was a couple of days of, yeah, it might have been like the first 24 games of my Hartlepool career. I never scored. <laughs> Not that you were counting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't score. I weren't playing well. And the, the keeper went down injured and they kind of like, you know what to do. As, does anybody want to go in goal? I was like, well, I'm not getting out here. I'll go in. <laughs> so I went in. Uh, Cross came in, claimed that, threw it out, uh, <laughs> came down to somebody's feet, um, <laughs> saved another shot. Anyway, after the after the session, I was in there for about twenty minutes. They pulled me into the uh, into the little hut while I was waiting for my dad to pick me up, and they said, um, "Have you thought about being a goalkeeper?" I was like, no. <laughs> they said, oh, we'd, "We'd like to sign you on schoolboy forms as a as a goalkeeper," and me, I, I, part of me thought, mm, maybe. <laughs> and I could just think my dad's going to be driving down the road. If I sign as a goalkeeper, he's not, he's not going to talk to me. So I was like, do you know what? No, I feel like I'm an outfield player. Um, but thank you where, for the offer. You know what I mean? Where, where were you playing, Richie, when you were a kid? Because I, when I started, I was I sort of started as a right winger, then I went to midfield. And I moved further back, I say, the older I got, when I was like 15, 16 and up. So where did you, did you always play up front? Either up front or on the left. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, never so much uh, to use my right foot, but no, yeah, out, out on the left or up front, um, and yeah, that, so I went back to playing Sundays, and um, like I didn't get back into. She I was in Sheffield Boys, like you know the school the for the for your for your city at like under elevens, but never got in. So and then I had a bit of a growth spurt, thirteen, fourteen, got back into that side, then like kind of made a jump straight into playing for South Yorkshire. Um, and at that point, pretty much all of the Sheffield boys team, um, the majority of them were at Sheffield Wednesday. And so I got asked to go down to the centre of excellence as it was then. You know, it, it's totally different, isn't it? Now it's like one night a week in a sports hall, in half a sports yeah. hall. You know, plenty of touches on the ball. Um, and yeah, and, and then I signed school by forms for them. And that's when, you know, my career started, left school, YTS and then turned pro. So who were who were the other players that you did your wide yes with that we might have heard of or went on to have good careers? Was anyone else? Um, the Harrogate manager Simon Weaver. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we were, we were same age YTSs. Um, he um, we all turned pro pretty much. There's a couple of lads who who didn't uh, get a professional contract. I think we had ten or YTS, and I think two of the lads didn't. Um, what one was which was was one of the best pals. He went off to America. To, um, the old university thing in America and still in America got his family there and everything um, and a lot of lads all turned pro but myself and Simon I think were the only ones who played league football lots of the lads played uh, locally around here following that um, but kind of the it was when I was a YT the first team at Sheffield Wednesday was littered with internationals and so you were around that every day um, and you know we John Sheridan, Chris Waddle, David Erse, Mark Bright, Andy Sinton, Chris Woods, Kevin Pressman could go on. Dan Pachescu, uh, Ian Taylor, Chris Bart Williams. You know, there's just so many names you, you'll you'll have heard of. A bit like your YTS when you're at Middlesbrough, Mick. But I thought that, I look back now and it was a good grounding. It was a good way of seeing how certain players train and apply themselves 
Um, and then all of a sudden, within a year, some of them have left, but now you're in the team with them and you've been asked to play at that level with them. Um, and as, this, <laughs> as I've said many times before, um, I managed to peak in my football career at 18 for about a month. <laughs> 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 Richie, when we, we spoke about this with Tinks and, and, and Tinks was really honest about, about sort of when he burst into the team, did you feel yourself you were, because obviously you had a huge impact and we know the goals that you scored and how good they were, did you feel at the time you were ready to play in the first team or did you feel a bit like, I need to earn me stripes with them or, uh, do you know what I mean? Be, obviously you were because you had that impact, but how did you feel about it? I think because as a second year I played in the reserves quite a lot. Um, and so with the reserves would, would always be those seniors that weren't playing in the first team on the Saturday or the subs or whatever. And so you were in that mix with them there. And, you know, like Sheridan and Waddle were in the reserves a lot during my second year. Um, and so that's, that, that was a great upbringing for myself, the, the standards that they wanted you to play at. And if they, I was playing up front, so if they wrapped a ball into you, it had to stick. You know, you've got to hold it. And it was, it was demands that was placed on. And because... The following season when I did turn pro, we went on pre-season tour and I was kind of going maybe to be another body and carry the skips and, you know, help out. And, and, and that was fine by me, by the way, you know, but all the strikers were, were all injured. Um, Hurst and Bright were injured and somebody couldn't travel. So I managed to play. So I was played three or four games in pre-season and scored a few. So all of a sudden the, the strikers weren't fit. So I was still in the team. So I think physically I was ready, Mick. I think yeah. physically I was, um, you know, I suppose strong enough at 18 to to, to mix it um, in terms of... You were strong enough at three, never mind 18. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, physically I think I was ready. And um, You know, maybe, you know, I've said, no one would have expected, you know, that, that first month or so to go as it did. And I think I, I made about 40 appearances that year. Um, yeah. And what I now know, and I'm not, this is not detrimental to myself, is that I just couldn't maintain that level. I couldn't maintain, not, not the quality of the goals or anything, but I couldn't maintain to stay as a regular in that Premier League team week on week, you know, year after year. Um, and eventually other players came in. And so, Richie, do you think if looking back now, and this is what I spoke about, looking back now when you've had your career, and you could advise yourself at 18, because I think you could have played at that level for longer. Do you think if you knew what you know now, you could have had that longer career at that level? Interesting. Because I, I spoke to Mark before about how professional you were, how so uh, you did the weights, how you looked after what you ate so to the, to the finest detail. Would that have helped in the early part of your career? Absolutely. Absolutely it would. And I wish it, it isn't a regret because you know, you might not have even had the opportunity. I got an opportunity and I kind of managed to grab it to a point where I got a, a longer term contract, which was which was amazing. I had the opportunity to play at that level, to play to the under 21s for England, to travel to Malaysia, to play in the under 20 World Cup with some of those and some of those players who I played in those teams with, a bit like a bit like Mark's uh, Tinks' in England team. Yeah. Had they were the cream of the crop, the talent of, of our generation. Um, and like I said before, you just I just that's the because the level they could maintain. But to answer your question, if I knew even though what I know now, I'm, I'm you know, how many of years retired about uh, nutrition and about recovery, um, about uh, strength and conditioning, I just think I would have I would have given myself a better opportunity. I thought I was very professional at Sheffield Wednesday and when I came to Hartlepool. But I think it, it's, it's now, now, now I visit, you know, I visit the players and stuff um, yeah. during my job. It's an actual um, pre, pre warm up outside. There's a session going on inside in a gym. So there's prehab, then there's a warm up, then there's a cool down. And you know, they might train, there might be a weight session, all the foods on and everything like that. So the, the game's moved on. I kind of probably could have, I was trying to move on with it. I mean, we, I thought we were very lucky. The facilities we had at uh, uh, Maiden Castle. Yeah, we were. We had, you know, we had a, a part-time fitness coach, but was on site all the time. So, you know, it was, I think we, we took to it well. Was it part of why we had a, a successful period? Because 
players bought into that and players bought into the recovery. Um, because I think that, I mean, I know we'll go into it, but from listening to the to, to other uh, um, editions of these podcasts is that that team were um, so tight knit and so uh, likable and because they had nights out and all that. I think the one thing that I, I knew that I wanted to mention when I was walking the dog, listening to it, I was like, this team was was on it in training yeah. and in games. And yeah, we, we, went, we went out, we, we did do it at the right time. And I think that was essentially important because those young players that were being mentioned uh, that were on the periphery and, and really put, uh, I suppose, some s- strong performances and backed up the more senior players was because they could see the seniors doing it. And yeah, I remember, I remember Richie picking like teams for a seven as I match, and you were that desperate to win that you'd be there'd be like arguments about who you and, and you look back now and you think that wasn't pretty nice on a couple of lads who were last or whatever. But it's because you wanted to win, whether it was a little keep ball session, uh, an 11 v 11, 7 v 7, whatever it was, that group of players, every single one of them, wanted to win and walk away so they had like one up on someone else. That was something I noticed. Sorry, I was sorry. I know Richie, you're going to say about it, but that was definitely something I noticed. Mickey. As soon as I started the club, watching training, even as a 21, 22 year old watching, I was thinking, this is a different level. Like literally every single game you lads played, you wanted to win it, no matter who it was or what it was. There's old, there's old sayings in football, and they get banned around, and you should you should train as you play, and we did that. That was set. You know, the manager set sets that, and and I think all the managers we had wanted it that way. And so when you have, you know, and I'll go over a range of players, but, you know, Kevin Henderson, Paul Stevenson, Tony Loma, Tommy Wid, Mickey Tinkler, you know, and you can go on and on and on. When the seniors and Spike and um, Westy and you know, Nels, Trig, all, all those players, when, when the seniors set, they, they set the tone for training and matches. You got those younger ones around, so it's Bracker and Krads and Icy and the twins, and Jack Wilkinson, um, all those players and Apple, all those players who played their part. They have to. That, that's the, that's the tempo. So they have to get on with it. And I think that's. A, I thought it was a great culture that that we had. And again, it was set by the coach and the manager, or it was, or it was, it was doubly done by the players who who put demands on each other. Yeah, I think he had a group of players, though, that at the time we used to play a table tes- tennis on a morning. And you'd have 15 players waiting to play a table tennis because all of them wanted to be the champion that day. And it, it would go into a little game of head tennis after training. If you were on a night out, whoever was playing pool, you wanted to win because it was just that bragging right, wasn't it, over your mates that you want. Like, like you, Simo, when you go to the pool with your mate, you want to beat them at darts so you can, you can sit there and go, yeah, I'm better than you at that. And, and when you put that into an everyday competition, the standards of everything you do with, I mean, some of our table tennis by then was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> you and Epi are unbelievable, but, man. But pe- people used to get in a train in half an hour, an hour early just to play a table tennis. That's how competitive it was getting with that group. So, Richie, going back to sort of when you made your debut, you always hear people say, oh, it was me boyhood, like dream to play for that club. How was it for you being a Chef United fan? making your debut for Chef Wed and, and obviously your dad and, and the rest of your family? Um, well, it was obviously an extremely proud moment. Um, make, I made my debut down at, uh, at QPR as a second year YTS. Um, I think it was about October time. Came on for five minutes. We won 3-0. Well, I don't know what I was having as a YTS, 35 quid a week or something. And I was on the win bonus. So <laughs> it was like... You know, it, you know, it was an extremely proud moment, and all the all the time from from the da- time my dad placed um, the scouts card on the table over Sunday dinner when I was about fifteen, um, saying, you know, they want you to go to Wednesday. The backing that I got from my parents, irrespective of who it was, was just immense, and you know, just taking you here, there, and everywhere. And so, for you know, imagine myself, we've got. You know, kids now, if you see your, your, your son or your daughter achieve what they set out to be and it's to be a professional football and to play in the first team, um, they're extremely proud. They, they were in London that day. Um, and then I managed, I got one start that year as well away at Bolton, the old ground, <laughs> for those old enough. Um, 
And then it was the following season that I had the impact. So I, I played a couple of games, um, but the game where, where I scored on my home debut in the uh, 96 season, uh, my mum and dad were in Spain. There it is. <laughs> Still available on DVD. You know what, man? When, when you when you got your 50th birthday, I'll finally put this on DVD for you. Is that a video? <laughs> I'll get that. I promise I'll put this on DVD when we get down here. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. Um, that, that goal, I was watching the goal on um, on YouTube today. 35,000 views that chip against Leicester's got now. And I still love the commentary. Um, is, he, is he really a beginner at this level? It's brilliant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they were back for that one. So they, 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 they were back for that game. Um, so I, I've scored against Villa on the... Uh, Saturday um, then we played Leeds away um, and I scored in that game which was a local derby uh, we won 2-1 uh, Leeds brought on a sub and he managed to wriggle in the box and took it away but it was offside that lad was Mark Tinkler oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you just get that one in Says <laughs> like. super but yeah just going, then, go on. sorry Richie just going back to, to Richie's mum and dad my mum and dad probably were the opposite of Richie's and, and came to probably two or three games in my whole career. So Richie's mum and dad almost became like my football parents. So wherever <laughs> we were going, I would go and after the game, I'd always go and see them and say hello. And I think even at Cardiff at the Millennium, your dad held Ollie well because it was that hot and gave him a shirt and all that. So um, just just on, on a, a total side note, but just how really nice... Richie's family are and, and they were like that with everyone weren't they Richie they were everyone used to go after a game to go and see them and, and I mean John came to Magaluf didn't he when, when he had just stag down and the lads absolutely loved it so um, I imagine how proud they were on, on those days when you made those debut well they made oh, your debut they were and, and obviously they, it was you know, gutted that I was, they were away for that goal um, but also on the flip side my dad's in some random bar in, on, the, in, on the Costa del Sol <laughs> And uh, my lad scored there. Do you know what I mean? So you, you must imagine how proud he would have been. But yeah, they were back for the Leicester game when I scored the, the, the chip. Um, and, you know, I'll say, those two goals in particular are arguably two of the best goals I've scored um, in, in a long career. Um, and I, I suppose it did set me up and it did give me a, a platform to, to try, you know, to carve out a career as a professional footballer. Um, and like I said before, to sustain that, not, not the level of the goals, but to sustain being in that team with those players um, is, is tough. And I think it, it gives me an insight and an absolute, I suppose, um, for those players who are my era of, you know, Ferdinand, Lampard, Gerard, Owen, you know, though, you know that were, were top class, world class footballers, um, the level um, that they achieved. Is just, is just phenomenal. Just that goal, Richie, I know people have talked about this goal a lot a lot with you, the Leicester goal, but I watched it a few times today and I looked just a little faint that you do just before clipping. But the, just with the celebration, I just wondered, was there a little tiny fraction of a second where you thought, oh my God, it's actually gone in? Before you then sort of went, yeah, of course it did, of course it did. <laughs> it was more the fact that Ersty's asking for it, he's pointing, he's going, play it in there. And I didn't. Now, you know, I'm probably thinking if the keeper catches this, first he's going to give me what for for not sliding him in. Um, and it, I suppose, I mean, Mickey's not scored that many goals, so he won't really know. But <laughs> all mine were good ones, though. Well, I suppose you know when you you know. I think it's what what plays in your memories, maybe because you miss them. But when you miss a chance or you miss an opportunity, it seems very slow motion. And you can see all the way that it's going to go wide over the bar, or in my case, in Morrison's car park behind, you know, behind the Vic. But when you score, it's kind of, it kind of it, it, it goes really quickly, and you, there's no has it gone in, has it not gone in kind of thing. Um, so no, I was more worried about Hurstie giving me a, a volley. Yeah, you talk about Hurstie there, Holmes, but there was some real big characters in that squad at the time wasn't it do you want to talk about a couple of them or any stories about anyone in that because I know <laughs> there was some big personalities wasn't it yeah there, there, there was and obviously and Ron Atkinson came in to manage us so another big personality um, and 
you know, I was, you know, the, the game where um, De Canio got sent off for, for pushing the referee over. Um, I was playing in that game. I came on as a sub quite early. Uh, somebody got injured. And so there's a, there's a tussle. I think it's Vim Young and Vieira. And it all goes a bit off. And I'm kind of close by and I'm kind of getting involved, but thinking Petit's there and there's a few olds kicking about. So kind of, I'm only 18, 19. I'll just, I'll just back out of this. Um, but you talk about, you know, characters and quality, like De Canio, Carboni, like, and you talk about their demands in, and quality in training, like, just, just first class. I mean, like, I know everyone remembers that game for, for Paolo getting sent off, but, you know, we've all seen his ability on the football pitch as a, as a footballer. But yeah, lots of strong characters, Mick. And I think, again, all of it just gives you experience and, and a, a bit of, uh, a, a bit of know-how about, you know, football changing rooms and and it, it gives you a perspective on because a lot of them again were international footballers and so they, they place high demands on each other and, and want to win yeah I don't know whether it was you Richie or someone else told us about De Canio that if he didn't think training was good enough he'd quite happily just walk off and say to the manager I'm, these aren't like <laughs> up to my level today so I'm just not bothering me <laughs> no, it was someone as tall as, and I know, I know he was the same when he managed. Sometimes he, the, the lads I know at Sunderland would just say, like, say to Fabrizio, right, I'm, I'm, I can't be with them today because they're not at the level I want them to be. I went, I, when Yogi was manager, we went in to see them because um, obviously John knew uh, Paulo and I knew his number two, and um, they were doing a little bit of running at the end. And is it Ryan Sessignon that was at Sunderland at the time, little centre forward? He was doing some running. He was just jogging along. He wasn't even trying to sprint. And De Canio got his hand and just grabbed him and started sprinting like, like he was a two-year-old late for the shops and just sprinted the whole way around the pitch with him. But then he took us into, he took us into the indoor bit and he's ex- trying to explain a bit of what he's going to do in the upcoming game. And he's sprinting there and he's sprinting there and he's come back and he's saying, you understand, you understand? And he's sprinting off there. And I said to John, I said, he's just 100 mile an hour. Everything he does is 100 mile an hour. And then he, he'll go off and do something else. So what? I, I, I don't know whether I really enjoyed his company or I thought I can't be in his company any longer. <laughs> in terms of the, uh, the, the, the moving on from the moving on from then Sheffield Wednesday, Richie, what? Tell us a little bit about the the journey you went on because you had a you do loan moves, had you, when you were at uh, Sheffield as well? Yeah, so I went on loan to Scunthorpe um, early early two. Th- Thousand, no, uh, ninety nine, uh, early ninety nine. So yeah, the first month of the season, um, kind of done pre season. Was quite clear I wasn't going to be involved, and in, you know they asked me to go on loan, and I went for a month, and I actually and I, I didn't stay for for a further month or you know for three months you could, um, and I wish I had it done now. Nice. I went back and thought I could get back in the team, and I don't sure if the, the team had got off to a great start in the in the, in the season that year. Um, and I was travelling over there with Sean McCauley, ex article player, um, and it, it was great, and it gave me a, a good insight. It was, it was in, I think they just got promoted, so it was in playing in League One as it is now. Um, played a few games, scored a couple of goals, and I probably should have stayed, um, and I didn't. And I went back to Sheffield Wednesday, and then by Christmas, yes, yeah, so it was a Millennium Year. Um, I went to Cardiff for three months over the Christmas New Year period. Um, again, different experience living down there. You know, in a hotel one night, traveling back home for a day off and that kind of thing. Um, again, great experience. Played with some good players, some good seniors. Um, so I first met Willie. Willie Bowen was there, um, and so some some good, some really good players. Um, and there was a possibility that move might transpire, um, which which it didn't. Um, and so by the end of the, um, well, that was that season. Yes, that season, and then I, I, it was basically another year on really until I had another loan move which was um oh no it was finally yeah I moved clubs for so February 2001 I kind of left Sheffield Wednesday went to Cambridge on a short-term contract um which I broke my foot after a couple of games um and so there was that summer of because they took over my contract I was out of contract in, in the June and, and not knowing where I was going to be um I remember being on holiday, um, run. I remember running, going on a run in like whilst I was away to you know maintain fitness and all that. But I was running to the phone box, 
because I, I didn't have a, didn't have a service on my mobile to be able to call you know an agent to say you know is there any any anything happening um so i spoke to him from a phone box and um something was going to happen at another club and it never did and it wasn't until um you know both pre-season had kind of already started that um he said you know we got to Hartlepool, we want to see you train for a couple of days um and and then that was that richie was i mean there's been times and and i hope you don't mind me saying this because i know how close we are but there's times when maybe your weight has gone up. Was that a time when you were sort of, was that a time when when you were moving clubs or when, was you still at Chef Wed then? Because I know how hard you've worked to keep in such good physical shape. And I know you've shown me pictures of, of, of sort of that you keep to make sure that you don't go back. But there must have been a time when something changed in your mentality where you think, well, when you either diet or what you were doing, because as you say, you started to become ultra professional. I think, yeah, the, I think what you're referring to is when we've had a, you know, I think it, that was a couple of time I was at Sheffield Wednesday and um, but it would have been a holiday time and, you know, a, a beach picture or something like that, we're not too, not too happy about, and that would have just been lack of, you know, kind of like, you know, you were on holiday for starts, so it was it was off season, but yeah. that, probably a lack of knowledge about um, what you're eating, maybe having too long off of of, tra- of not training. Because if you remember back then, when you finished the season, you kind of did nothing. Yeah. You know, until you kind of, you know, a few weeks before pre-season, you might do a few bit. And that's kind of not the thing to do. You learn as you get older, maybe a week or two of nothing, but you have to then start maintaining and it's actually a great chance to do a lot of strength work in the off-season, you know. Um, so, the summer you're talking about wasn't that summer. I was right, in actually, okay. Because I broke my foot, I was in um, I was in good nick that, that, that summer. And obviously, when I came up to the pool, um, it was, I needed to rebuild my career. That, you know, my, the, the, the five-year contract at Sheffield Wednesday had finished, it had gone like that. Um, and there wasn't, a queue of clubs lining to sign, you know, lining up to sign me. So I, I knew during that summer I had to be be ready for, you know, a trial or whatever it is, training session to go and prove that you are one still capable of of, of contributing to a team that want to get promoted, um, capable of holding your own in a training session, capable of, of of earning yourself a one or two year contract. And so that was the mindset. You know, I needed to re reset my career and, and 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 try and like you know why would you even worked hard and being 14 15 to try and make it you know was i on the verge of of fading away and and, and not being a footballer anymore yeah it must and have so, been hard it, it must know, have been hard though richie when you you've been at a young age at the heights that you were and obviously people talking about you to then all of a sudden have that sort of fall if you like earlier in your career but it just shows how much you said you wanted to be a footballer that you would come on trial somewhere for a couple of days without having the attitude of well I'm better than this or I should get a contract without even coming up and it, it and it's that mental toughness that I don't think a lot of players have now that especially when they burst on to say young and play a couple of games that they expect to go to other clubs and we had at Harlepool we get people from Sutherland and Newcastle and they just didn't have that sort of motivation within them to earn themselves a contract, even though they had a lot of talent, they didn't show that desire. But you obviously had that within you. I think that was my upbringing at home. I think you know, I think it was upbringing at Sheffield Wednesday as a young player. Like I've said before, good seniors around, um, and I needed to prove to me, I suppose, that I can, you know, go. No jokes aside, go to Hartlepool for a year score 25 goals and and who knows and that didn't happen did it but, you know. <laughs> it did it did go over about five years <laughs> <laughs> but you know i mean the mind the, mind, the mindset to try you know i wanted i wanted the career i wanted to um because i suppose until i came to hartlepool i was always the young one at Sheffield wednesday so you know i'd never played 46 games you know, 46 starts or 30 starts whatever it was and and had like what you might call a, a I suppose a, a campaign 
uh, of because you're always in and out, you know, and then add some loans and then I was back in. But, you know, do you ever feel you feel um, that you were contributing on over a full season? And so I know that, that when, when Chris had done his homework and rang um, people who'd had me at Shepherd Wednesday, particularly Clive Baker, who'd had me at, at 14, 15, um, probably to ask about his mentality, his professionalism, what's he like as a person. Um, and so after, I think it was after a day or a day and a half or something like that, I went to the ground and, and the club offered me a contract. And I signed for two years. Um, and the journey starts there, doesn't it? <laughs> do, do you think it helped, Richie, that you, that you came at the same time as, as Daryl, Bassey, Tommy, and, and the sort of four of you arrived, arrived at the same time and all four of you sort of came with a reputation of, of bringing quality? Um, I mean, probably not Triggs so much, but uh, <laughs> we had to pay for him. But do you know what I mean? Tommy had obviously played at a high level. Bassey had been at Birmingham, a bigger club, and yourself. And, and do you think coming as a, as a group helped you settle in and helped you sort of get your career started? I think it definitely helped to settle in. Um, you know, I know Tommy's from the North East, but he'd come from from from, from South and, and Bassey and, and, and Daryl. And we were all in the Norton together at Seaton Carew. So we were kind of travelling over to training in one car. You get to know each other, eating together. Um, so I think that definitely helped to settle an in period. Um, and, and obviously you get to then know the other players in the changing room pre-season friendlies. I think we went to Norway the first year, I think it was. Um, and I do think it helped me. And I do think it was it, it was an influx of, you know, four signings. You've been, you've been at a club and you were, you know, well, we signed four today or you know, two today, two tomorrow. It's, it's four new bodies in the building. You would hope that the current players are thinking, oh, great, you know, we think these are, are going to give us the edge where, you know, we've, we've not quite got there in the last couple of years. Maybe this is our year um, and I, 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 as soon as I came to train I could see and I, mean, I knew obviously it, was, it had been close the, the previous couple of years but um, that we had a chance we had a good group of players um, a, a good mindset and some quality that would, would give us an opportunity It was that, that season wasn't it where the, the story keeps being told it's come up a couple of times about the the Beckham free kick in, in, in that, that afternoon where you had a few pints and suddenly something just clicked within everyone's mind that this was going to be all right, even though it had been a sluggish start. It was a poor start. Um, and, and this, you know, I think you can look back to other promoted teams and it's happened to them. And it's almost like a, um, something happens where the, teams, the team was good. The, the you know, the, the application was good. The results just didn't go very well at the beginning. Um, the, the, the day you're talking about when we qualified for the World Cup and all that, and basically we, we, had a, we had a strong performance the next game. The very next game was the whole game, Mick. Was that the one I scored? Oh, that was, I see. <laughs> yeah. Hang on. I'll toss, I'll toss them up, you slam well, I think it was the last minute left foot, make it 4-0, <laughs> but, but, but I, mean, I, told it, you, it, I told you I was a centre mid. It centre wasn't... Long. There was a performance coming, you know, and, you know, all right, we all went out together. But like I, like I said at the beginning about the, the, the winning mentality, the training, something something was coming and Hull were flying, I think, at the beginning of that season. Um, and that then that was our standard then. You know, we beat them 4-0, Flash got a hat-trick thing. And that was, the, that was the standard. And obviously Flash came in, that was another signing that came in, you know. So... It, it, that was the standard, and we went on a on a, on a great run. Um, should we not talk about how the season ended? Just move on to next year. No, we've got to mention your book. If anything else, we've got to mention. Oh no, no anyway, the, the book was the following season, wasn't it? This was. Oh, was it? <clears throat> this, uh, oh. the, 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 the first. Cheltenham as it happens, I've got a copy here, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> the Cheltenham game, on about. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Well, I still I, well, I spoke a trig, and I still think triggs. Miss was worse than your penalty, by the way. And I still say that to this day. He should, he should have got us through without you having, having to miss that terrible penalty. Was it the worst penalty on the night? Or? I, can't, I, can't <laughs> I can't remember. I don't think I've ever seen a penalty like it where it's hit the bar, the post and the keeper. I've never. But do, do you know what? I mean, I know we've fast-forwarded very quickly through that, that season and obviously there's, there were some great performances and 
Lots of uh, goals. Lots of goals, you know, some, some great victories. Um, but from, yeah, you know, missed the penalty and that's the, it's all of a sudden the end of the season. And nobody could ever, you couldn't tell somebody how you feel about that. Yeah. But what I can tell people is how my teammates and my manager and the coaching staff reacted to that. And it was just phenomenal to look back now. I remember getting back to Sheffield. I must have, must have got off the bus at the service or somewhere. Yeah. And I was living in, a, in, a, in, a, in an apartment in in centre of Sheffield. So the car park wasn't near the flat. It was somewhere else. So I'd got a bag, suit carrier. It was about three in the morning or something, chucking it down with rain, trudging through the middle of Sheffield city centre having just missed his penalty, um, got in, probably didn't sleep very well, but did wake up, had a voicemail off the manager. Um, basically, everybody's behind you. It was, you know, every, somebody has to miss, you know, you've had a good season, we're going to go again next year, followed by probably calls off Mickey, Spike, Westy, Tinks, Daryl, you know. So there's, a, there's an uplift immediately. It, you feel... Well, I felt I'd let the, the, the team down, but it was always going to be someone, you know, um, to either send us through or, um, unfortunately, you know, not put us through to the final. Um, so, so in terms of how you feel, in terms of a, a, a regarded member of the squad, you know, made me feel great. And um, it will never take away from me missing a penalty because I don't, you know, still feel I should miss one. But... Um, the 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 team bond that I had with these teammates, but actual mates, um, was set in stone. I suppose from 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 that miss, and um, I think we all felt it, but it, it kind of brought it home to me. Um, and again, it, it all all it did was was want me to strive for more for next season, and it not be not be playoffs. Can we go and and you know and try and win the league? I remember on uh, the the following year, twelve months after that, there was a, there was an awards ceremony, the North East Sports Awards, I think it was in Sunderland, and I think there was a dozen of you or so, half a dozen of you on stage. And I remember uh, Mickey got asked the question, "Did coming so close last year really drive you on?" And, and Mickey's answer it was something along the lines of, "Yeah, it really drove us on. We all got together and, and decided we we could get automatic promotion." Just straight away after Richie missed his penalty. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, to be honest, I think that was obviously Richie was upset for a couple of days. Mate, you said he got phone calls, but we probably ended up going to Magaluf after it. Or, or do you know what I mean? And and it'll probably been Trig or Tinks or one of the lads, and he, he, he probably just firing oh, arms, bad penalty that, and, and sort of that. You know what I mean? And, and and you start speaking about it, and then all of a sudden it's almost nothing to worry about because you're talking about it again it's it's been brought up and I mean Holmes would maybe not agree but it was like well it's it's gone now and, and we're going to move forward and, and and concentrate on what's coming rather than and dwelling on on what we've what we've missed out on but I think you can only do that if you've got a real friendship and a real bond between the players that are together there the, the, the following year, though, Richie, I mean, the 2002-03, when we had the automatic promotion, I think you were got the player of the year, I think you were in the team of the year. And at times, it, I, when I was doing this earlier, thinking of questions and what we need to ask you, I remember thinking, I've written it down, it, it just looked, you in particular, it just looked like you were just out in the park playing with your mates at times, just trying things and things were coming off for you, goals were happening, and it just looked so carefree. Well, I think you can do that when you're playing with confidence, but you, you're also playing in a good team. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there was times during that season, like, and this is, you know, it, it happened again in the following promotion season. Mm. It's not arrogance uh, uh, whatsoever, but you just felt you would turn up. And if you switched it on, if, you, if everybody was at it, we would win. And that is not arrogance at all. That, that is a professionalism that, that grew inside us um, as a confidence, like I said, it's not an arrogance, it was a confidence that you need everybody to be at it to win any game of football, any football match. You need seven or eight to be, you know, eight, nines out of ten, <laughs> most of the time. Um, but there was, within that season, it was, it, was a, it was a structure, you know, sometimes 
you know, if I, I was on the left or I was might have been in the middle because Paul Smith was playing on the left or I might have been on the right. We've got good strikers. You know, we got we were solid at the back. Um, we we knew what we were doing. We were, as I said previously, as we, we chatted earlier, we were we were at it in training through the week, um, and the results were a reflection of that. I I thought, and like I said, we we had some good players. We had goals in the team. Talk about Tink. You know, I probably scored eleven, I think, from out on the left or wherever I was playing. I think Tink's got twelve or thirteen. Yeah, absolutely. The strikers obviously got the list. I probably got some from centre half. Nicky obviously might have got one or two. <laughs> so there was goals in the team. I don't. So, I don't think it was one of my better seasons. That one. Which, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but when I say when you're kind of not worried where the goals are coming from is what I'm trying to say, um, and and also it wasn't just those players that I've kind of mentioned. There was all the players within that squad I mentioned. Bassi before an integral part didn't play a load of games for Hartlepool, but for the time he was there, was instrumental in the professionalism in how we did things. Again, another good senior pro that was led by example. Whether he was you know whether he was playing in the first team or not. Um, did things exactly how a professional should, and so because you've got good people and and good, you know got to be good players to get promoted, and I, I didn't know whether you were going to ask me about, you know, uh, do you have any regrets in in football or in life or anything, and I I, I kind of want to say no, don't have regrets. I just wish in that season or the season the other season we got promoted that we could have delivered a league title for the club. Yeah, that was one thing that I'd love to see Mickey stood up on the podium, lifting the trophy, because when I when I did win one at Chesterfield, that feeling of being the champions of that division was amazing, and that's one thing that's kind of missing for me from my time at Hartlepool. That I think in one of those seasons, you can say we didn't deserve, it, we didn't win it, but we were close, and I just wish for the for the supporters, for the town, for the players in both of those squads. I wish we could have delivered a league title and been champions of a division that we'd competed well in and almost, you know, almost got it got it over the line, but it just just fell short a little bit. Yeah, I, th- I, I totally agree, Richie, with you. And I, I think in those sort of teams that we were building at the time and the one we had, you went into the game with very little doubt in your mind that you were going to win. Like there'll be there'll be seasons where you think oh, these are a good team, and if we go, we concede for. But those, I remember going to those games thinking, even if we're 2-0 down, it's, it's not a problem. We will go on and win a game. And I think if that's the mentality of the team, it's always going to be successful. And I think we had that right throughout. Like you said, even going down into the, the younger lads that were playing in the reserves, they had that mentality of, oh, yeah, we're hardly but we're going to win today. And I think that was why we were so successful. Yeah, I think I've seen that change, you know, during my time at Hartlepool. And it's no disrespect to the players that, that came after you, but I've sensed obviously there's the club slid down the league and into non-league. It's almost been like, I want that arrogance. I want, we puff your chest out, turn up, you're Hartlepool United. We're going to come here, we're going to get off the bus, win the game, and we're going to go home and get all about our business. And I've sensed for too long that it's almost been like a bonus if we won. Yeah. I mean, like we'll turn up and we'll do our best. And if we win, great. But if not, we'll get back to training on Monday. And I've, do, I've don't know if I can get on board with that because it wasn't what happened in the formative years when I was there. Yeah, I mean, I I would class me and Richie as as really really good friends, and like I said before, families have grown up together. But I remember having plays and rounds with Richie and in the tunnel in the dressing room. But the one thing we'd always do after, and it was because we wanted to win. It wasn't that we we're having a go at each other. We, yeah. But we wanted to win, and, and they had that spirit about you. And, and if it was Richie's fault, he would come up after and put his arm around. It's not a problem. We'd get on with it. But it was because we had that real winning mentality within us that if someone was mate, even if it's your best mate, you're going to tell him. But yeah. that would be taken in the right way. And like I said, we've had busts up over the years in wherever it may be. But it's because you want that winning mentality. And if you let it slide, it's very hard to get it back, which I think is what you're talking about, Simo. I think I'd agree with in terms of. When you win and it's been a strong performance or you've nicked it in the last minute, particularly when you're away from home, you, everybody's on the bus, jovial, happy. You don't really dissect the game as much. I think you learn a lot from when you lose. I think you've got to learn. <clears throat> I think as a player, you've got, to, you've got to learn to lose in the right manner, if that makes sense. 
And one of my managers kind of told me and a group of us that sometimes um, you've got to learn to lose. And I think and I th it could have been Plymouth. And we think we got, they were, I mean, Plymouth were a good team at that time. We could have got done three or four. I think we're in League One. I know Coops was manager. And that's a long journey home, obviously. Yeah, I remember that, Kim. Um, countless coffees at the back of the bus. We probably all had rows in the changing room. Wasn't a great performance. There was no rowing on the bus. It was it was talking about football. And there was none of the kind of banter, I'll put the ball away kind of thing, which might happen when you've won. It was, this hurts a lot. We've got to get back to Hartlepool, which is probably a six, seven hour journey. Um, what was it? You can't always put your finger on it. It, it. Sometimes it's just a bad day. And when I said before, you need seven or eight to be at it, we might have had three. It's not enough. And you can't always put your finger on it, but what you can try and do is, is not want that experience again. We probably did. We probably had another drumming somewhere, but it's part of learning. Um, something that, that, that I found that it was, the, the, you know, whether, you know, sat with Nels a lot and, you know, with, with Westy and, and, and other players have just, you were trying to think, well, was it, you know, could we cope with that player who was on it, you know, who was on it that day? Why? Why didn't one of us do something about it? And we'd get it out. And it weren't, nobody was rowing about it. It was trying to learn from a heavy defeat. And you've got to learn. And I think because of those two playoff campaigns in, in, in League One, um, we'd learned from winning quite a lot in the previous couple of years um, to having to take some, some, some losses. Um, and ultimately, obviously, we were almost there in terms of getting out of that division. But I think... The, the rows we might have had, Mick, were nothing, are they, really, in comparison? It's a game of football. You know, it's, you know, well, why didn't you pick him up or you didn't pass him on or, you know, why don't you show him inside or whatever it might be. It's a learning and you, and then you, you move on because yeah, you dwell on something too long. It, it just eats into the next training session, the next match. Definitely. I think, I mean, I, I'll, I'll never, ever forget this game and like you all both know my man. I remember playing Blackpool away where we got absolutely battered. I think it was 4-0 in the end, but we're, we're three nil down after so many minutes and, and half the fans left and had been looking forward. And after the game, I remember coming home and, and like Nick was like, what happened? I was like, oh. I was like, I just don't know. I honestly don't know why we played so badly for the first so many minutes and and what the difference was today to other days where you go away and, and like you said sometimes you just can't put your finger on it and it's not for the, the lack of trying it's not for the way you've warmed up or anything else it's just that too many of you aren't playing very well and against the better team they'll drub you three or four nil like Blackpool did that day and I, 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 that always sticks with me that big game because I remember thinking yeah we've let people down today we've let all those fans down we've spoiled the weekend because it was a weekend in Blackpool but it wasn't because we weren't trying. It was just because we weren't playing very well as a group. Yeah, remember the game. I was, you know, like I said before, and you, if you're two or three out of ten, I was one of them. And we probably all were around there. You know, it could be even the goalkeeper might have played well and kept it from being five and six. And I remember exactly that game. It was a beautiful weekend. Fans came down. We let them down. Um, and again, the, to, to, to flip it, you know, we did that to teams as well at yeah. our place. You know, long journey for them, you know, that kind of thing. So we did it to teams. And like I said, you, there's, you've got to accept it. You've got to take that on the chin and, and not want ever that to happen again. Probably did, like I said, but less than, than you'd ever want it to be. And if you, if you learn from losing, um, another one of our managers always said, you know, because there have been games where we were all right and we played quite well and actually didn't deserve to lose. Could have been something that went against you, a decision or whatever. And his saying was the best team doesn't always win. And, and that can be true in games when it's close. Yeah. More often than not, you know when you deserve to win and deserve to get beat. I just remember coming home after that Blackpool game and I was thinking the only good thing I've done today was I got a yellow card for wiping Bullock out because he was absolutely class on the day. I remember just thinking, I'm going to have to try and stop him. And I got a yellow card and I was like, if that's the best thing you've done in a football match, you can't have had a good, you can't have had a good game. Agreed. It was fair <laughs> early on in the season, wasn't it? I don't think those days came along too often over that season. Though. It was after we just after we got promoted, was it? Was it 2003-04 then? Could have been, yeah. Yeah, because 
I remember the Hartlepool Mail went to town on you a little bit, and I think they put something like embarrassment, or you let us down. I'll like... tell you why. Yeah, I remember it as well because Lof, uh, Nick Loughlin, and we can laugh about it now. We bought Man of the Match was a Weatherby Wheeler that <sighs> never that never fails to deliver. And I was like, I was filming with him, but he was probably right. Like. The thing is that I always thought about, I mean, I'm protective because of the role I was in and because, you know, the, the club, but, you know, to, to label the club like that and to, go, to, to really go for you so soon after you'd won promotion and after three playoff campaigns in a row, I just thought to go at the higher level and then get torn apart in the press. Was <laughs> um, but sometimes that, that, that can also fuel a player, can't it? Yeah, it can, yeah, definitely. That can also fuel a player. To, to achieve better and to do and to do more and uh, you know times have changed now you know I'm kind of I played when social media was around but towards yeah. the end and I had some not nice comments um, said but at the time it was like you know it was the it was the local press that would give you a comment and the, the old kind of fashioned um, message boards and it just <laughs> I was thinking about it today and <laughs> I haven't played a lot of football since since I retired. Um, we had our charity match, didn't we? Which I thought I played all right in Mick, did you? Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> well, get on this. So I played in a uh, a kind of a dad's five-a-side up at my <laughs> local uh, like 3G pitch. And then my mate, who was a, a, a Wednesday, he said, hey, I've been on the uh, old Wednesday forums today. You, somebody's give you a mention. I was like, really? For, for what? I was like, oh, well, apparently you played five-a-side against you the other night. <laughs> and uh, someone had really commented, you know, so how did how, how did he do? Ex Wednesday player and all that. <laughs> and you think thinking the response might be still got a nice touch, can still pick a pass. The quote was, "Retirement retirement has not been good to him." <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm 42. I'm not playing football anymore. I'm still getting trolled. <laughs> uh, brilliant. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but if you tell if you're saying that the press and, and the criticism drove you on, it certainly did those two seasons in League One, didn't it? Because the first season was so dramatic the way it ended uh, at Bristol City and the playoffs and everything like that. But then to go on and, and do it again in the second season, where people would have probably thought, well, that was a bit of a flash in the pan. Hartlepool surely can't be another playoff contender again in in 2004-5. It was just that momentum we had was seemingly unstoppable at the time. The momentum is key, and I know I don't want to go over things, you know, I know Mark spoke about it and things, and, and Daryl probably did. The momentum is huge. The, um, the additions, I suppose, the signings we made, um, bought into the, the philosophy of the manager. Um, when, when, when Neil came in, and again, don't want to repeat things that people have said, um, unbelievable character, unbelievable to play for, unbelievable to be around uh, in terms of, you know, he's... he's happiness and humour. But again, a bit like what I said earlier, the drive for him for us to, that he put on us to win was huge. Like, that's, that's the biggest, like, in terms of us being successful for those two years, like, he, he, I think we got it, but he, he kind of kept it on top, you know, kept on pushing and kept on pushing and kept putting demands on us daily. Along with Scotty, you know, the, the intensity of training. I mean, people would come off training like, you know, on a Thursday, like it was a World Cup final, you know, because the demands were there. Um, and that's, that's, I think that was a, is a key to being successful. But as I said before, you've got to have good players. And we had some good players. And we've got, again, I know I said it before, but we've got goals and we've got even more goals. You know, with, with, with the amount of goals Boydie has scored and Joel, and Effian, um, I'm probably, and I'll probably leaving somebody out here, John Daly, or the, the, the goals that we produced from all over the pitch, but in particular the strikers. Wayne's going to be raging there, isn't he? Wayne's, man. Sweden's got 15, <laughs> minutes, 20 goals, isn't it? So, yeah, so, 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 there, so there, yeah, sorry for, uh, sorry, Tone. Sorry. <laughs> the dynamic of that, sorry, Mr. Albert, the dynamic of a midfielder getting that many goals. And becoming such a key player for us, because as an as, a, as an opposition coach, Mitch, if you were coaching coaching against that team, you you've got to be aware of Boyd and Porter's movement and skill and running in behind. You've got Effie and Williams all coming off the line and get your goals, but you've also got a box to box midfielder 
who's going to run beyond the strikers. It's no good trying to be nice to a Bolton now. You've forgotten, mate. <laughs> I was thinking about this all day. <laughs> that the dynamic of... Like I think you spoke about it before, Mick, about normally like now a lot of play teams play two holding midfield players. And was it, you know, with 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 Sweens not going AWOL like we kind of accused him of sometimes, just going beyond the strikes and said, Take care of it, the lads back, I'm off. I'm gonna get myself another goal. But you know, the coaching, the natural instincts for you know, not so much effing, but it would do, you know, just for the for the wider players. So I mean, we're going to do diagrams of people for the wider players to come narrower, so that we didn't get hurt down the middle of the pitch. You know, if they were going to break on us, they can break on the outsides. These kind of like details that that, that enable Tony to go and get those goals, and you know, that put us right up there because of the goals in the team. And I know the lads will be fuming at the back. I've not mentioned. I know. I was just about to say we had a half. Don't mention the goalkeeper. Two centre halves. It's all about the goals. I'm <laughs> sure we had a record clean sheets in a row or something like that, didn't oh, we? That was yeah. 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 Jimmy McHugh. Oh, yeah. is it? The, 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 I suppose the platform you're allowed to build from. And, and the strikers will be the first, once they've stopped celebrating, to say, you, you, you know, the, the, without the platform, you know, well, we did have one game like that, didn't we? We lost 6 4 at home. Wrexham, yeah, Liam. Wrexham. So, so Rick, every time we scored, I was like, right. Can we stop conceding now? We're back in it. And it was just a freak game, wasn't it? But it was a freak game. But to, to, to go back to my point, you know, like, like Tinks did when he was more box to box in getting goals, Sweens came in and, 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 and got the goals. Players in and around it all fitted to that, to that system. And like I said, if, if one of the strikers were, were, were injured on or, you know, had to come off, you know, Either Effing would slide up front, and somebody would come in on the right, and it, you know, the, the 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 good players we had all fitted into a system which, which was, was obviously successful. But again, just just that that tad short of of, of making it into being a, a historic team, really. Richie, we're talking about strikers in teams, and and obviously your name hasn't been mentioned as a striker. Then where were you playing by this time? Oh, is it left? Left hand side or left back or nah, left or right? I think front of Shuggy. Yeah. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Left or right? Maybe central sometimes. Definitely not up front by then, mate. <laughs> we, we obviously talked about the Cheltenham penalty. So it's only fair to talk about it. And do you know what? I know I love the commentary from your Leicester chip, but the commentary still gets me from the Tranmere final, uh, semi-final. Um, the, he's done it. He's set up a reunion with his former club at the end of the month, and it's like. Oh, it still gets me now thinking about it. It's, it just just, it's just before Richie goes on, someone did ask me what my sort of happiest moment playing for Hartlepool was. Was it the, the the getting promoted? Was it going out at Cardiff? And I would say Cardiff was my proudest moment, but my happiest moment was the Tramway game. When Richie scored that penalty, that is the happiest I've been on a football pitch because A, for him personally, and for what we'd been through beforehand and the, and the feeling after in the dressing room was just amazing. And I remember having I had half a lager upstairs and I just sat there and thought, from a career point of view, I am as happy as I probably will ever be. And it was just an amazing night. That, that took some bollocks though, Richie. Um, not as much as the players who went before me though, Mark. I think I've said that before. I'm not playing down you know, my role in it, but those players that did go before knew what I'd been through and probably went before me because of that. Yeah. And they are mates and teammates, but mainly mates, I would say, that probably looked down the line and gone, Is he gonna we're gonna put him through it again? So the people who went before me, the five takers, you know, absolutely top draw. I think the next three was it uh, I know West Westy Sweens or was I the eighth? Uh, well, you know, you tested me. I don't know. Tinks, Tinks took one, didn't he? Tinks was in the five, I think. Yeah, was he? Oh, I know Westy Sweens. took one. Eh? Yeah, West, so West, I West, think it was Sweens yeah. and Westy, and I think it was Emmy or the goalie. I think, but uh, I think that's that's. I agree with Mickey. I think it's as happy as I've ever been 
on a football pitch um, because of of what I had gone through, but it was mainly because the the memory I'm mean, I only know now from seeing the video every now and again. Um, obviously, on an anniversary of when it happened and things like that, the the the, the look on the lads' faces when they're running towards us, um, and Strack and, uh, and and Nelson, I just all the boy Tommy Butler, everybody's like, I think we're so proud of what we'd achieved. I mean, I, mean, I remember the feeling on the on the pitch at Bournemouth that we got in the playoffs was was an amazing achievement because that's the kind of the end of the season you you 46 a game and you and you've managed to get there you've set out probably what we achieved to do and um, was to try and make the playoffs again and so then to take us one step further than we had the year before and for me to kind of like put a penalty away after what i've gone through at, at, at cheltenham um but mainly is is a big a big thanks and a collective i suppose that the guys that went before me um Oh, kind of, and, and Dimmy obviously for, for for what he did in the sticks that night. I had a shocker that night in the game. To be fair, <laughs> I bet nobody wanted to take me take a penalty. Because <laughs> uh, I we've been to Tranmere so many times since then, and and the the room where you all went and had a half a lager in, I'll still, I, I, that's just literally down from where the where you go in for the press. And every single time I walk past that room that night is in like like it was last week. It's amazing, amazing memories. Um, and then the Millennium Stadium. I mean, it was just so cruel the way it unfolded in the end, wasn't it, Richie? It was uh, a, a, an un unbelievable occasion that could have been. Yeah. The whole build-up to it, the, you know, the, the couple of nights in the hotel before it, the build-up of sorting out tickets and, you know, and all that kind of thing. Um, going to the stadium, having a look, and then in the warm-up, can't really remember much about it. I'm probably a bit like Mickey with that on an occasion that, you know, seeing the ground fill up, I knowing that some of my pals have got blue and white on that are in the Sheffield Wednesday end. Um, I've got some of my mates who are Sheffield United fans who are coming our end. Um, and then obviously all my family and everybody's family. And it, it, I, I, I think you might have said this before, Mickey. I don't think I've ever watched the game back as a full mm. game. Um, probably should uh, at some point. Don't, can't really tell you hand on heart how we actually played in the game in terms of first half did we deserve to be a goal down that kind of thing but i just remember a momentum building in the second half when we did get one back um and it's obviously again this is definitely not a regret but we just used to get to, to have got that over the line i know i said what before wanting to deliver a championship um for the football club um uh, but for us to get into you know the second tier um we know really would have been a historic moment for the club um but it wasn't to be you know and there's you know whatever circumstances there are around it um you know was it a penalty was it not that kind of thing you know as much as you know and again pretty much and you'll probably have him on at some point but the the bit you spoke about mick about when i missed my penalty and everyone will always just chuck that in every now and again when we have a meet up and i'll kind of throw it back at westy i go well <laughs> Westy had not got sent off. And he goes, no, if you'd have not missed that penalty, we would never have been in that position. We'd already be in the championship. <laughs> Richie, again, I know. So you can only do that with, 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 with those, with those ex-teammates, mates, as I call them, you know, that it was a heartbreaking moment for him, for us, um, not kind of getting that over the line when we'd been good that year. Like, we'd, we'd had, you know, a lot of good victories. Um, some individual performances like Boyd's hat trick against Sheffield Wednesday in the rain, just you know, phenomenal, you know, talented player who produced something like that on a horrendous evening. Um, we had some great moments, and they're all they're all brilliant memories, whether they're on on a, the wrong side of um, of a win or not. They're amazing memories that that will stay with us. We'll always talk about it. We'll always, as I said before, I mean, we like being nostalgic. We'll always be able to have the discussions with. Uh, supporters about our time, and though and there's been the time before. As I remember, we were at a a, um, a presentation evening one year, and there was the the early promotion winning team than us, and they'd got together. You could see exactly the same. They just liked being in each other's company, and that was their team. This was our team, and we have obviously you know, between me and you, we went through a few teams at the times we were at the football club, but 
Um, I was the same, I suppose, with the, the group of players got promoted with at Chesterfield. Um, they're amazing memories of, of, of what is a short career, what we said right at the beginning. After the Millennium Stadium and the, the hangover that was the 2005-06 season, we needed a new sort of lift, didn't we? Danny Wilson came into the football club and, and, and that 2006-07 season, it turned into something absolutely magnificent. But the start of it, for the team and, and, and for you, Richie, as well, on a personal note, it wasn't particularly vintage, was it? No, I suppose it's it's a little bit like um, the start of our very well, my very first season, the 2001-2 season, where we didn't, you know, expectancy was there for us to do quite well. Um, didn't quite start as, as we thought we should. Um, again, sometimes you can't put your finger on it. And then, um, you know, after I don't know how many games it was, um, I, was, I got left out of the team, which is, you know, the team wasn't doing well. It's absolutely fine. And then obviously I went on loan to Port Vale. So it was a kind of a, a strange, strange period, I suppose, because I've been a mainstay of the team for a number of years. Um, but that's, I suppose, that's being a professional footballer. You can be in and out of a team uh, or in and out of a club uh, very, very quickly. So um, the team did great. I think what you know, while I wasn't there, I scored a load of goals, um, and so when I did come back after a, being a month away, um, you know, I think I went straight. I don't know, I might have gone straight back into the team, which is always good going into a team that's that's doing well. You know, if it, if it had come back and the team had still not won many games, it's a very difficult situation. It's like if you you know if you, if you're out of the team for a while, you know, it's easier going into a team that's winning because everybody's playing quite well. Um, so to, for me to come back and I think I played pretty much the rest of the season um, I remember chatting because I know you'd, you'd hit 200 consecutive appearances during the previous season and then you went to 234 and I remember I don't know if it was when you came back last season or whether it was it was a different time but Scott Loach made 100 consecutive appearances for Hartlepool yeah. uh, in his two years and I remember him saying to me as he was approaching 100 he was going this has got to be up there, hasn't it? This has got to be up there. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm at, um, <laughs> I'll tell you this, but uh, Richard, and he was like, how many? <laughs> I mean, it's unheard of figure. 234, was it Richie in the end? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've been asked about that about many times when we've spoke about stuff, when we've been up to talk at Hartlepool or in, in, in programme notes or anything like that. I think there's, there's a few things that go in with that. It's obviously your own professionalism, but two, you need the backing of the manager or managers, in my case, over the five and a bit year period. Yeah. Um, but you need to be really lucky with injuries um, or suspensions. And if you don't tackle that much, you don't really get suspended. Um, but you, you need all those factors to be able to be able to do it for you know that many that many consecutive appearances. So very fortunate. I was Hereford away. I know when the, the, the when the record stopped, um, was on the bench but didn't get on. And so, you know, you then after, I don't know what it was after that. Um, what, from when I came back, if I've started another consecutive run, I can't really recall it. Somebody might. Um, but that period was, I suppose, it was a bit strange, but it was also maybe, you know, was it something that I needed at the time? I don't know. It never well, something I really dwelled on. That, that I, I, just, thought, so I thought it was the time, and I don't know if I've said this to you before when we did the other talking, but... It was almost like Danny Wilson flexing his muscles a little bit to say to the rest of the lads, look, I'm sending like this lad out. He's played 200 odd games, but I've got no qualms about taking him out of the team. If you, if, you know, and like sort of setting the tone a little bit to everybody else to say. I, I think that, I think that's what it looked like to the rest of the players. Some we couldn't understand why it was happening. Uh, do you know what I mean? And it's not as though like, Richie was a bad egg and Danny had come in, there was a falling out or anything like that. And it was just a, and I think it was, I mean, I don't, I've never asked Danny about it, but I think it was just a case of, I'm in charge here and, and this is a way, and, and it worked for him in a way, you know what I mean? It worked for him that the, the, the goal at the end of it was achieved. Richie was a bit of a, a pawn in the move, if you like, you know what I mean? And it, he had to go and come back, but, I think it was. I think it was Danny. He knew how close we were as a group, and it was just a way of saying, "Look, I'm in charge now, and what I say is going to go." And and as I say, it, it worked for him in the end. So it was a a good decision. I don't know, but it was the one that definitely worked for him. 
I, I saw it as he said, look, you're not going to be playing at the moment. And I've worked with Danny three times now and absolutely um, adore the fella. I think he's he's brilliant. He was a great manager for us. Um, learned a lot from him. I think we both did make me yeah. more of it on, as a coaching side of things. And and so it was never it was never really an issue in terms of, well, I went to Port Vale and, was, and played. Um, and then after a month came back and was continually playing. So, um, like I said, I don't know at the time, was it something I needed in my career? To be like, well, go on loan, son, or you know, if yeah. you're not going to be playing here, would you, you know, go on loan? So, um, it that was far. it worked out well. You know, we, we got promoted. The the, the, yeah. the aim was to get promoted. Um, we achieved that. Um, again, I feel like I repeat myself, but we could have been close again to delivering, um, you know, a Champions Trophy uh, to win the league. Um, but the main aim was to get there, and I think. I know, in fact, I know I was. I think on any of the pictures of us getting promoted that day, or when we got our runners-up medals, that I felt, I felt it was short. Like when we got promoted the first time, I didn't celebrate it as much as that. And I look, and I think you should. I really think you should because it's very hard. You know, I've had three promotions in a 23-year career. They don't very they don't come around every season, so you, you should celebrate. And I think I was just disappointed that we didn't win it yeah i think you know it, it, i remember i think my wife had said to me like we just got promoted are you talking about you know i think that was only i think we all probably felt a bit similar um but the scenes at wickham were amazing when we got when we got promoted um you know it was a joyous occasion i think it was just because we didn't win it um it was it was mainly it was for the group of players and the supporters the club you know we Club's been close to doing it a couple of times, and if you know you want to be part of that team that does deliver it, um, and so I feel like a little bit like that's the one thing that, that was missing from my old time at Hartlepool. That season, Richie, it's not something we've touched on with, uh, I don't think, with any of the guests we've had on previously, but it's certainly one of my biggest memories, and I'm, I'm pretty certain it'll be one of your two biggest memories as well. The win in that season at Darlington was just <laughs> incredible, wasn't it? I mean. Up with the whole away and singing, we are unbeatable. Doesn't get much better than that as a footballer, surely. No, that's as a performance, um, because of who it's against and where it is. And you know, we're coming towards the end of it's another three points towards a tally that might get us promoted. Um, the whole occasion, I just that was what I was saying before about the arrogance, not arrogance of confidence, a team that was capable of going out and beating anybody in the division. Um local rivals or not. I mean, that does add that bit of spice. But the following we had, um, the 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 quality of the assists that day were just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Richie, was it that day when, before the game, where we all had to put towels over our head? That's the one. I remember, in, in the dressing room. So, Danny right. was working with, with Brian at the time, and he said, right, everyone get a towel and put it over your head. And then he put m and uh, is it one shot? Lose, or yourself. You only... lose yourself. Yeah, lose yourself. And I'm thinking, so I'm like trying to peek under my towel to see if anyone else has got a towel on because I'm thinking, if there's only me with a towel on, I'm going to look like a right knobhead here when I take it off. But then I'm peeking underneath, but everyone else has got a towel on, so I'm putting my towel back down. And I was just thinking, I couldn't concentrate on the words of the, I, I know them now, but I couldn't concentrate because I was that worried that everyone was just going to be sat there with no towel on the head at the end of the song. <laughs> well, it worked me. Well, it, it did, worked. yeah, it definitely worked. You know, and these are you know, I mean, the great memories. But the, the, I did. I think Dimmy made an unbelievable save. Was it a nil nil? Yeah. Did, yeah. did Clark his free kick with it, or yeah. was it a chance from somewhere one, else? One good save. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I, like I know, I mean, Effian's second goal was just like probably the best goal in Hartlepool history. Um, for how we pulled it down, volleyed it away end, away at Darlington, going to get promoted almost. But his first one was an unbelievable finish. Yeah, it was. I saw that the other day. It was an unbelievable finish. Um, and then, obviously, you know, it was it Monks that scored the third? Yeah. yeah. Um, just to round it off, and, you know, I was playing at the back by then. Um, so it was me, Nels, uh, Clarky, uh, and Mickey, and, and Dimmy in the sticks. And was, I think, for a majority of the period, it was quite consistent, that back four, back five, of, you know, injury-free, suspension-free, um, we kept a lot of clean sheets. Um, 
I became that kind of part of that platform that gives uh, the talented players the <laughs> freedom to go and express themselves. Um, I think again, I think that back four went out in concert that night, Richie, didn't we? And Clarky, Clarky showed us the, the highlights of concert that night. Moving on, obviously, back to League One then, and so we went into the centenary season, uh, Richie, and, and you. You know, absolutely cleaned up again. You won the Player of the Year, I think that year was. Am I right in saying the two thousand seven eight season? And you then go into the awards ceremony. You've got Player of the Decade tucked under your arm, and you've voted as Player of the Century as well. I mean, I remember trying, trying to us and Frank trying to arrange all the trophies to get the four hundred <laughs> taken was was quite a challenge in itself. Amazing memories. Oh, amazing memories, and the you know the the, the things that you look back on in your career. Um, those are only ever, and you know, I'll never downplay them. They they mean a lot to me. But you only ever win any individual accolade if you've been part of a successful team and a good team with good players and good people. So they're as much as part of of my my whole time at Hartlepool. Everybody I played with shares a part of that with me it's because because I was there such a long time, um, played that many games. The club is part part of me, it's part of my family. Um, and those accolades to have um, are, are they're breathtaking for me because you know you want to be part of instead of I want the, that that team championship winning trophy. Um, and like I said someone will win individual awards along the way that getting it, it those 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 awards and, and being in the PFA team there a couple of times are like a a reflective to for me to look back on and to be proud of, and, and all of us, any professional footballer needs to be proud of of what they've achieved because it's from an early age you're working against the numbers in terms of progressing to to that level. Um, but that uh, those th th those trophies mean a lot to me, and they're you know they're downstairs, and you know the along with the hat trick ball. I was going to bring that up. You asked Tinks to get his hat trick ball out, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you got it? No, it's downstairs. Oh. I was going to get it. But the on display, are they, are they, all the stuff you've got on display. Or do you, uh -huh. you, yeah. Yeah. Because the next thing that you were given was a few years later, wasn't it? Because obviously you were not only consecutive appearances, but you were racking them up cumulatively as well. And when you beat Watty Moore's record in February 2011, that was... What, what was that like? I mean, can you still... Remember the, the feeling of stepping onto the pitch at Exeter that afternoon? Exeter, yeah. Came on a sub, probably don't know how long for, last 10 minutes or something. Um, eight minutes, cheers, Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, you know you're close to it. And um, at some point, you know, I've overtaken other great players at the club. Um, and that, my record is now there for somebody to go and beat. Um, you know, I never have thought when I first time would have, you know, played more than Watty Moore for the club or, or Brian Honor or Mickey or whoever's in it was in the list. Um and so and Nobsy, you know, so there are lots of people I think you might have even mentioned this week in one of one of your tweets about the people who've already been on and the people yeah. who were in our squad who have accumulated a lot of games for the club. Um I don't know, maybe you look at that, is that something that you, you can look at if the good players, good people, you know, it was part of a successful period. We all played a lot of games. Is there something in keeping players at a club for, for a longer period and adding in to and fro? But football doesn't always work like that. Maybe we were just a bit of a, uh, a unique one off where we had a lot of players played a lot of games for the club. So the memories for me traveling back from Exeter are, are possibly like on my phone a lot. People wishing me well and a great achievement, friends, family. It's probably on Twitter by then. Um, <laughs> and just, just a lot of uh, congratulations, maybe people picking out the odd game where they thought I might have had a good game and things like that. So um, to then go to beat that and then go past 500, you know, I, I never thought I would be able to achieve that. But um, Richie, I've just literally just had a message off Tinks and he's he wants to know if... Um, all those trophies with having such a big back, did it help carrying all those trophies? <laughs> There's no way that Tinks has texted you that. <laughs> You've made that up. 
about my <laughs> I'm trying to put it on Tickler. There's no way Tickler knows what questions you're asking me. It does, because I've, I've sent them through to him, and he's already sent one back to the... He edits all the questions, Tickler. Yeah. Um, I suppose it does help having a larger back to carry things. <laughs> And then, obviously, even after you left Pools, obviously, you've still, you still look back on the club with affection, didn't you? I mean, I, you know, one thing I want to say in this podcast is a big thank you to both of you because when I made a call to, to you on, in 2017 when the club was on its knees and we needed to raise some money, within 20 minutes, I think both of you were in for a talk and let's do it. And you were down at the club and, and I think that showed just the affection you both still have for Hartlepool United. Yeah, I think I think some more, and I'll let Richie answer obviously for himself. I think when you spend so long at a place and you have so many happy memories, and then you have connections with staff there, with fans and and players, it's part of my life. You know what I mean? I spent a lot of the, a lot of my life so far connected with Hartlepool, and I think if you can help in any way, and I think this is where you get a little bit frustrated when people say that you you don't care about the club, you, you're negative about this, you've got this, that, and the other. The only time I've ever been negative about the club is when I'm looking out for one of my mates or, or, or a friend. or And it's not at the, at, at the club itself. It's So it's it's quite frustrating at times because you do spend so long in a place. And like I say, I, I, anyone that asks me from that era for anything, I will get in a car and drive or if I can't help them out. And it, it, because you have such an affiliation with the town, even I mean, you go somewhere now and you see a Hartley Pulse trip, it takes you back to those sort of memories and those times when it was such a happy period. So, I think for me, it no matter what league they're going to be in, doesn't matter who the manager is, who the chairman is, you're always going to have that affiliation because you spent so many years there and, and spent it with so many good people. Now, that, Mark, when you, you know, when you asked us to, to come up, the, the club was we, we needed to do something. It's, it's, it's not even a uh, can I count out. I mean, the only question is, you know, it, it, it can work, do it another yeah, yeah, I can do that. Babysitter sorted. I'm up, I'm up the motorway to articles, not a problem. And again, aren't you? Go on, Go on you're all right. Go on again. Back. No, you're all right. Go on, yeah. yeah. Um, to, to, so for us to do, to just to get together, have a chat, like you said, Mick, we've got that much affiliation with. Um, and it's not only the people who have worked at the club for over a number of years. You know, the, the, the journalists we, we've known um, over the years have worked for, for the local newspapers, the supporters that we've got to know, the people who supported me and you through our testimonial years um, was a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the fan base, the, 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 the supporters that you'd see a lot at events. Um, we might even see them at the um, Art Said More services on the way home from a, from a game, a minibus had been down to Exeter or Torquay or something. And they just, you know, th there's a bond of, it's not player and supporter. We kind of know, you know, we know these people, we know people's names. And so, like like you said, Mick, that's been a massive part of my life. Um, we, you know, lived in the Northeast for, for six or seven years, um, got married in the Northeast. Um, we, we spent so much time, I think, at a football club, a huge part of our careers. It's just, like I said, it's a part of my my career, but my family's life as well. Like the amount of time my mum and dad have been up the A19 or, um, you know, my mates have come up for a game um, and they'll always say it, oh, we're always welcomed in the, in the lounge at the Vic, always welcome, probably because they spend a bit of beer, behind, beer money behind the bar. <laughs> but they, they, they absolutely, they, they adore it. And, you know, I know that, uh, and he, he wants to mention because he's been tweeting you. Oh, my best mate Whitey. So we had a, we had a. Uh, I think it was my thirtieth birthday while I was living in in Durham, and we had a fancy dress party, didn't we? And yeah. we had a bar in Durham. And then we all went back to for a house party, um, and <laughs> there's my mates got to know you all, all, all the footballers, and you know everyone's having a, a great time and. I think Tinkler was dressed as a Viking, if I remember rightly. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it, Mark, can't you, with the, with the black and that. Um, and all of a sudden, there's a bit of, what's going on here? So I've gone in the, in the, in the little kitchen, and uh, my mate's bleeding. 
Whitey. So what's going on? And apparently what's happened is my mate loves Whitey, loves boxing, loves it. So Tinks says, give it the old bob and weave. I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll have you a spar Whitey and just, just jabbed him a little bit, cut him or cut his nose or something. Tink has just gone, what are you bleeding for, you daft git? <laughs> right? So White, White has got a mention, but it's probably not the one he wanted. <laughs> but it, it's the same night, it might have already been mentioned this, it's the same night he also put some Doritos in my toaster. He put a, he put a slab of uh, mince under the grill. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I remember coming down the next morning. Obviously, everybody's gone. There's a mess everywhere. And in a plant pot on the behind the sink, there was an axe, a, a Viking's axe, <laughs> stuck in the plant pot. Yeah. Well, just, just going back to the people who you sort of spend time with. I was at the beach the other day at Seaburn, and I went to get some fish and chips. And there's a big queue of people waiting for fish and chips. We were with some friends of ours I worked with, and the kids and been at the beach. And I saw Sean, the bus driver. So he's in the queue. I hadn't seen him for ages. I contact him now and again and give us a big cuddle and a talking away, having a bit chatting. And I could hear Nick talking to our friends about, oh, who's that? The Michael sort now. And she was like, I don't know who he is, but he must be something to do with a football club because of the way they sort of embrace each other and the way they're talking now. So afterwards, she was like, who's that? And I was like, oh, it's our old bus driver. She spent quite a little time with She said, I can tell straight away. I'd never seen him before in my life, but I could tell how close you were with him because of sort of how your body language is and how you sort of reacted when you saw him. And I came in and I thought, isn't that lovely? Isn't that a nice thing to have with people that, other people can see that you that, that you spend time with them and, and how much you sort of like them as people. And I think that's that for me is what I take away from my time in Hartlepool is how many people I can say that about. Like like Richie said, like some fans, media people, people that you work with every day, people that you might only see once every three or four months at a golf day or something like that. And and I think that's a really nice feeling that you've got that connection with with so many people. I think, and just going back to the to the whole, like, just how welcoming all the, the our group of players were to my family mates and all that. Um, because I know my mates will, will listen to this, but that you know, joking aside, and why he wanted to mention, and he's <laughs> he's got it. But the the support they've given me as a footballer through my career has been unbelievable. Like from when from leaving school, a lot of us went to like primary school together. And then we met a couple of more lads at senior school and, you know, we're still um, really, really close. But not once when we were, you know, were at 17, 18, did they kind of go, are you, are you not coming out? What are you not coming out for? Oh, I don't mind about a game tomorrow. They knew how important it was to me. Mm -hmm. So their support network um, has, been, has been really important to my career. And obviously now I'm retired and you can go to the pub on a Friday, early bar and all that. You know, it was something that's never, ever been part of my diary, my life, um, and for them to have just always been there means a great deal to me. It me, me mates from school that they were so welcomed when we had a get together or they came up for the weekend um, or we went away or whatever. And, 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 and those, those are the things that are not football related in terms of performances on the pitch. They're just good people. So, Richie, you telling me you went to school with Whitey? <laughs> I thought he was at least eight years older than you. Oh, mate, he's not going to be happy with you. <laughs> <laughs> and he got absolutely sparked by Tinks, by the way. He was <laughs> straight in. Have that, Whitey. But while, while we're talking about mates and, uh, and events and stuff, do you want to clear up the old Custard Gate story? Or Well, this is a story that, that, uh, that Mark Tinkler told us the other week and, and it was something that we didn't then include in the podcast at your request. So if you want to sort of tell us a little bit about the background, then yeah, go for it. It's going to hurt to tell this, you know. Just, just before we start, Tink's text me after we recorded it and I said, Ums won't let us tell that story, Tink. She, she texted me, what's wrong with him, man? And that was it. What's yeah. that? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell, well, what it is, it was um, obviously once I, I, you know, I, I'd left. I was at Chesterfield and was um, I was chairman, chairman of the PFA by then, 
And so it was the PFA Awards night, which we'd gone to as, as, as players when we've got in team of the year or, or we'd had a good team or whatever. Um, but obviously, it's a different role now for me. So the lads are on a table and as, as chair, got to go up on stage a couple of times, got to do a speech. Um, and it's a black tie event. Um, and so at some point during the evening, I've just gone over to the lads' table. How is everybody all right? Uh, you know, was the steak nice thing? You know, all that kind of thing. And listen, these are like, you know, as close of teammates as, as they are. They've come from the Northeast to support me in my role as, as chairman of the PFA. So um, as, I, as I'm walking away from the table, thought nothing of it, lads have had a drink, all right, great. I mean, I was having a good time. It was about 10 minutes before I had to go on stage, which was also to present the, the, uh, the main award to the player of the year, which was also going live to the BBC, the match of the day too. Um, and as I was walking away from the table, I can't believe you're laughing, by the way. <laughs> as I'm walking away from the table, a guy kind of three tables down kind of just pops up and stops to say hello. And he just says, um, I just want to let you know that one of the lads on the table, I think they, they flick some food at you as you're walking away. So he's turned, he's turned me around and he, he's got his napkin, bless the guy, and he said, oh, there's custard all over your tux. <laughs> so he, he dabbed me down and got a bit of water and dabbed it down. So I'm fuming. Like, these are, like, Mark, you're still laughing. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> right, so... <laughs> we, we know how Tinks has told this story. <laughs> so I don't, obviously, I'm... I kind of, I'm not going to bother with that. I've got this to do. I've got to remember. Da, 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 da. I've got to, you know, I've got to get round to the stage at this time. And so after, you know, I've gone on stage and everything's absolutely fine. And I got back and I told um, my wife, and she's like, "I can't have this here. Don't worry about it." And I was fuming, and only because it was a big night for me, what I was about to go and do. Um, but I can't be angry with them. <laughs> there's some of my best friends in the world even though somebody did it and no one's no one's owned up to it as yet apparently it just landed on there. apparently it just landed on there mark apparently there's custard flying about the grosvenor hotel in london <laughs> right. so just 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 then going back richie to the time obviously in uh, what would have been the summer of 2013 when you you left hartlepool in the end what was the the process behind that and how difficult was that? Um, it was extremely difficult. Um, I alluded to it right at the beginning about, you know, it was the first time I've been without a club for, for a long time. Um, I think it, more than that was, I, I knew down at Stevenage that it, it was possibly going to be my last, Crawley, sorry, Crawley, oh. wasn't it? Um, I knew down at Crawley that it was possibly going to be my last game for the club. I didn't know. Um, I wasn't sure, so I kind of was able to say a thank you to a load of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very touching moment. Um, yeah, and it could have been, you know, it turned out it was my last game. Um, I think it was more, when I look back now, it would have been nice to have done that at home, maybe, if I knew I was leaving. If I was um, to have done that to, to, for the supporters that had supported me tremendously well at home um again it's just fine you know we were in america on holiday at the time um and it's kind of almost like all oh, right okay and i must you know i didn't know whether i was still gonna stay at the club as, as a coach or not um and so i suppose it, it came to an end quite quickly without a, you know maybe having a plan in place which would have been absolutely fine you know and so we didn't i suppose you know mickey and john I hadn't been told whether he was staying on or not. Um, and so I suppose it, for, 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 me, for me, you know, if that was, I suppose, if we'd have known, it would have been nice for us. I mean, you know, we've been back, of course we have, but um, I suppose to being on the pitch. I mean, listen, we've had amazing memories. We've had our testimonials there. We've, we've said a, a huge amount of thank yous, but I, I think um, to have been able to say goodbye, if you like, on the pitch in, in one occasion would have been nice. I mean, it's not a... It's the East football, isn't it? You move on. Yeah, I agree with Richie. I think I've, I've spoke to this, we're going way back now, but when I was speaking to the, the councillor, I said, I felt like 
even though I do agree it was the right time for me to leave, I never got a chance to say goodbye in a way because it's like, right, you're going and, and you get a chance to say about Simo and, and Davy the grounds. And, but it, it, like you said, just to go out on the pitch one more time and just to say thank you to the fans that have supported you all that time would have been lovely. But it, it's almost like not unfinished business in a way because you've just never had the chance to do that and you've never been sort of asked to do it. And I think it's probably too long now f- to do it in a way. But, um, yeah, I totally agree. I think for you, I, I think if the club knew that was going to happen, a home game for you would have been such more of a special event and we could have planned something for you as, as friends and staff and, and just made it a bit more of a celebration than what it was, really. Uh, yeah, I, think- I came out, not, not long ago, I came back, you know, and came out just on the pitch before the game. It was really, really nice. Just nice to see everybody. Nice to see the supporters. Um Difficult. So, I mean, the, the first time I think I came back to the club was the following season, but playing for, you know, a competitive match against the club. Yeah, yeah. Um, I came to that game, yeah. I remember and it. And then it came to the, the, the last game of the season when um, when we didn't stay up in, in the Football League. I came with the kids that day and it was a, a strange feeling, obviously, because, you know, just wanted to be there to show support. Um, and I'm sure as, 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 as time moves on, you know, we'll, we'll be, you know, the times where we... we we both go back um, to the Vic, and nothing will, um, nothing takes away those those amazing memories we've had. Like we've, we've spent a long time talking about them, and I don't, I don't think me, you know, the thing about you know, do wanting to do say goodbye one last time is any kind of, um, you know, down on my, you know, time, you know, to be there for that length of time, play that many games, um, I suppose. You know, we, like I said before, we're kind of nostalgic, and you want things to be just right. And they're not always right in life, are they? But you know, you can plan things that don't work out. But as an as an overall, um, it's been, you know, like we said before, a huge part of my life. And then the, you know, the day I left and I was out of out of work, it was a kind of like, well, well, I'm, I still want to be a footballer. I didn't think that I would be a footballer after after playing for. You know, when I got to like thirty two, I didn't think. Maybe I would play for anybody else, but um, you know the desire was there for me to go and do it, and you know I managed to go and do it for another couple of years. I I, I have regrets from that time, Richie, because I I think that I could have played a bigger role in making sure that you got that goodbye. Because looking back, that that was the right thing to do, and then the way that it was handled and and how it all came about was was poor. And um, I think I think at the time though, Simo, the club was a little bit. Sort of fraction, wasn't it, between sort of the management, the staff, and and other people within the club? And I think uh, the communication lines weren't great between everyone at the time. And I don't want to go into it now, but I think looking back, it would have been a better way of doing it. But there's nothing you do, and I don't think it's going to sort of taint anything, like Richie said, of how oh, he thinks of the club or anything like that. But it's just you do look back and you think that would have been a fitting send off to who is being the best player. As I said, yeah, as I said, Mick, you know, we you know the testimonial is that night, isn't it? You know, I was on on the pitch with with the little one and yeah. you guys were all there and support was there. It was a great evening. Um and so you know there's there are there are too many good memories that we can't even fit them on this you know this this short chat we're having. So listen the overall in 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 terms of my my time as a Hartlepool United player are are stories and, and memories playing uh, professional football or, or you know creating lifelong relationships with 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 teammates um, they they they're just outstanding memories and I don't think that <clears throat> just me doing one last goodbye to, you know that's I don't want that to take effect at all because um, <clears throat> you know I did it five hundred and Forty odd times, <laughs> you know. So it was a, you know, that's a privilege to do that. Brilliant lads, that's uh, fantastic once again, Richie. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been brilliant to look back on on all the years you spent at, at Hartlepool and in your earlier career as well. No, I've absolutely loved it. Like I said, I've listened to and, and I've listened to or seen um, all the ones you've done so far. Because um, I was a bit nervous at the beginning. <laughs> trying to live up some of the some of the uh, some of the the guests you've had so far, but no, it's it's always for me to be able to talk about because of the, the length, I suppose, of my Hartlepool career. Um, it's always a joy to talk about, you know, because there are so many 
good people, good memories, um, you know, promotions and all that kind of thing um, are, are are part of what's what's made my majority of my football career. So um, I thank you for for inviting me on. The tenth, the milestone one, Mickey. Yeah, that could be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no, cheers, Richie. I mean. As our group of players, we we all love each other a bit and all speak to each other. But just speaking to you and seeing you on on the camera tonight's been brilliant. And and I was saying to Mark before, and I'll say it to you: if anyone deserved a career in football for working hard and and going above and beyond what you had to do off the pitch as well as on it, you certainly did it because you were you were so far ahead of others in in our generation. And and the amount of work that you put into being a footballer is. I can't speak highly enough of you and, and and fair play to you because I didn't put as much work in as what I probably should have done. And and that's why you went on to play for such a long time. So um, hats off to the player of the century, but there's a reason why you were player of the century. Cheers, pal. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mick. So, Mick, brilliant to have Richie on. That was fantastic chat. I mean, he's obviously going to be you know, an interesting guest to have on and to cover all the things that he did while he was at Hartlepool was, was brilliant. Yeah, I think, I mean, me and Richie are really good friends. I know a lot about what he does within the PFA and he takes a very, very seriously the welfare of, of players past and present and the ones he looks after and trying to help them in any way he can, whether it's education or, or contracts. And I know he's been really, really busy at the, in lockdown and, and it's been quite tough for him at times, I think. Um, so that's interesting hearing that side of him and what he's doing now but talking about the times I mean it's just fond memories isn't it and you think about how many games he played and and do you know it's just a, 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 everyone says about Richie he's a nice guy but he works so hard to be a footballer and, and that's the thing I always tell people and he's a, he's a role model for me to if you've got that talent but you put hard work with it what you can achieve and and every act clear. I mean, we didn't even mention when he went down to, to meet the Queen. You know, there's so many, so many other things you could speak yeah. about Richie. And um, as I say, he deserves all the plaudits and all the and all the accolades that he, he got from his time at Hartlepool. And a good way to round up number ten on the Switcher Player podcast as well. Yeah, number ten, as I said before, was uh, just an idea that you had, and we've got together and do it. And, and hopefully, they've been popular with the majority of people that's listened. I know we've had some some good figures and, and and we're going to keep trying to do it as much as people want to listen and, and get some more interesting guests on. But I think, um, who can you, who can you get that's better than Richie, you know? So it's, it's going to be hard to follow Richie because he's such a, a, a well-known person in, in Hartlepool and, and around the world really for, for what he's done in football. But um, hopefully we can get some, some good guests coming soon.